My name is Carol McCoy. Today is July 18th, 2017, and we are in Nashville, Tennessee to interview my colleague and former judge, Muriel Robinson. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Hello, Muriel. Hello. I would like to start this interview by asking you some basic questions about your background. And if you would, tell us your full name, where you were born, when, and a little bit about your parents. My full name is Muriel Jean Robinson. I was born in Davidson County on February the 7th, 1944. My parents were Sheriff Garner Robinson and my mother was Henrietta Estelle Nita Hauser Robinson. And were they born in Davidson County too? They were. And how about your grandparents? My grandparents, uh, my uh, grandfather Warwick Gale Robinson came from Indiana. They were originally from England and he and a sister settled in Indiana but he didn't stay long. He came down to Tennessee and settled in Old Hickory. So. And what about your grandparents on the other side? My maternal grandparents, uh, my grandmother um, was Henrietta Gussman Nita Hauser. She was German and married a Swiss person. My grandfather on my mother's side was Edward von Nita Hauser. And von Nita Hauser was titled but he came to the United States and dropped the Vaughn and just used Nita Hauser. So he was Swiss. My grandmother on that side was German. But they were in the dairy business here in Middle Tennessee. That's a big family, the Nita Hausers mm -hmm. in Middle Tennessee. But I think um, the name Gail mm -hmm. runs throughout your family. Is there any history to why that name is so prevalent in? the members of your family? Well, my grandfather was named Warwick Gale Robinson. And the Gale is the male pronunciation or spelling of G-A-L-E. So we do have a lot of Gales in my family because a lot of us were named for aunts or grandfather. My brother was Edward Gale Robinson. My daughter is Kathleen Gail Robinson, and it's spelled G-L-E, just like her uncle Gail. My nephew, Gail Bright Robinson, General Sessions Judge, is G-A-L-E. So we have lots of Gales in the family. It is a family name, and it's, uh, it's been passed down, and it'll be passed down further. I have grandsons. One of them's named Warwick, and one of them's named Garner. <laughs> so. Well, you, you said that your maternal grandfather was in the dairy business. What did your paternal grandfather do? Well, my paternal grandfather, Warwick Gale Robinson, was a, quite a man. Uh, he had a farm in Old Hickory. It was where the Old Hickory Country Club is now. He had a farm and, uh, had, and bought uh, acres on uh, what is now State Route 45. It's called Robinson Road, and he had cattle, and he had uh, horses, loved mules, uh, just the regular farmer with the, all the kind of, of the animals that come with the farm, but he was also a grocer, and so he had a grocery store in O'Hickory in uh, World War I and World War II. He was a grocer and a farmer. It was kind of like a farm to table <laughs> back then, <laughs> but that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And how was it that your father uh, followed in his footsteps? Well, my father was born uh, in Davidson County. He was one of 13 children. When was he born? Oh, my goodness. He was 83 when he died, and uh, so he was born, I think, in 1906, perhaps. Right. Or thereabout. Uh, and uh, he was in Old Hickory, and he uh, uh, worked on the farm. And he did a lot of things, too. And, you know, during, during that time in Davidson County, it was between the wars, and Old Hickory was a very important place because the powder plant was there. And so 
being the entrepreneur that they were, they had several businesses. They had the grocery business. He ran a Y for the camp workers that came in. And so they were really ensconced in uh, Old Hickory, Tennessee. And when you said that it was the powder? Powder plant. They made powder or powder? Gun powder Ooh. during the war. I mm -hmm. didn't know that. Um, so how did your family, your father and perhaps your grandpa, how did they get involved in politics? Well, they got in politics really early on, but it really arose out of their other profession, which was the funeral home. Uh, my uh, father, Garner Robinson, and his brother-in-law, H. Dayton Phillips, and my aunt, from which I was named, Maud Muriel Robinson, those three started the funeral home in Old Hickory in 1929. Mm -hmm. And so they were running ambulance service and burying folks and, and uh, <laughs> doing quite a lot. Knew Your a lot father of would only have been about 23 when they started that if he was born oh, yes. in 06. Mm -hmm. Pretty young. Mm -hmm. Right. And so out of that, they became politically involved because they knew everybody in Old Hickory. And, everybody in the county because back then you know Nashville and Davidson County wasn't quite as big and populated as it is now. All right. So there is a little bit more uh, history I want to check with you about your father before we move on to your history. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the book that's been written Secrets of the Hopewell Box and for those who haven't read it it's a fabulous uh, account of the time that your father served as sheriff and the people that he knew. And could you tell us a little bit about that? I'm very familiar with that book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is a good Southern history of any Southern town. Mm -hmm. uh, it's political and it's basically uh, a story about the friendship between two men. The, uh, one was my daddy, Garner Robinson, and the other with Dave Brooks, who was the author's great grand, great, let's say grandfather, Jim Squire. Jim Squire's grandfather. Uh, his grandfather and my father were best friends for years and years, and uh, he he was with the uh, Davidson County Patrol. Uh, Jim Squire's um, grandfather was or father. I think it was his grandfather. But uh, anyway, it's the story of of politics in Davidson County back then. And I read the book. Um, uh, I, I knew it was coming out. Uh, I read the book. It was passed by me to make sure that things were accurate. And, and Jim Squires did a pretty good job of getting stories and tales accurate, with the exception of sometimes he spelled Gail, the name, our family name, Sometimes he spelled it G-A-I-L, which oh, it's never been that. <laughs> I'm surprised at him because he's like a member of the family, too. Um, now, we know, uh, or those of us who have lived in Davidson County, that your family were very strong Democrats. Very strong. And we, those of us who have read the book, know, as you said, there are a lot of good tales in there. Do you have any favorites in that book as far as family stories or the lore that's contained in that book? Well, um, <laughs> there's a couple of things that, that uh, actually happened. My, my daddy's friends were very devoted for him, and my dad was usually the candidate, so they always supported the candidates and did a lot of helpful things for the candidate, except sometimes the candidate didn't know it mm. until after the fact, <laughs> so that's a little risky. But back in the day, your friend was your friend, and he was going to help you, and sometimes he didn't have enough time to ask you whether you So your daddy to help. was the sheriff and the undertaker? Well, yes, he was the coroner at first. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and then he, he graduated to, to being the, the sheriff. And there were lots of political campaigns, and so he had friends that helped him. And, and of course, he was still in the funeral business, too. And so he, he was burying a lot of folks and getting a lot of votes because he knew a lot of folks. Did, did he serve in the legislature? He did, but that was later on. Oh. So the, the stories that you mentioned in that book, uh, the one that I remember the most was he had a friend, uh, and I remember this man very vividly in my childhood because he lived to be an old, he actually, I think, outlived my father, if I can remember. But 
he, um, his name was Dick Jones, and Dick Jones loved Garner Robinson, and they were pals, and Dick Jones would do anything for Garner Robinson. They were out one night fishing, uh, night fishing, and my father uh, dropped his wallet mm -hmm. in the lake or river or wherever, the, wherever they were, and he turned around to Uncle Dick and said, Dick, I dropped my wallet. Aren't you going to go in and get it? And he said, I sure am. And he jumped in that muddy water at night and found that wallet. <laughs> so that really happened. Yeah. Yeah. Election-wise, you know, he was, uh, when you, you want votes and all, and you try to improve the, the fare of people that live in your neighborhood. And there's a lot of folks in O'Hickory that needed their road, road paved. Well, that's kind of hard to do, except overnight before the election, the road got paved in one section. So I don't know how that happened, but that was a friend helping Daddy out, and Daddy didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say was the reason that so many people were attracted to your dad and wanted to just be supportive? You know, he was an amazing man for his time. He wasn't a very highly educated man. He had basic high school education, but he was a farmer. And if you out ever try to outfigure a farmer, you can't do it because they're counting heads all the time. You know, whether it's cattle or whatever it is, they are, they know their numbers. So, um, uh, and, and, and he, he was into a lot of things. Um, he loved the funeral business because he was a people person. And politics was made it even better because he, he, he knew a lot of people. But he was a very kind man. And I can't tell you how many times that children got shoes and didn't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. Or in Old Hickory during the war, when the men had to leave and the women were having the babies and the guys were gone because they were in the service, they, my dad took them to the hospital in the Red Angel, which was the ambulance. That's what they called the Red Angel. And then stayed at the hospital to make sure the mother and baby were fine. And my, most of the time he had to stay and give blood to both of them. So we got kidded a lot, no hickory, about most of the kids having a lot of Robinson blood there. <laughs> And then he fed families. They couldn't afford the grocery bill. So my aunt, who was a partner in the grocery business, they would run a tab on everybody. Never asked for the money. Just said, when the war is over, if he comes home, we'll, we'll make a deal. Some of them paid on the spot. Some of them never did, but they didn't care. Yeah. So as your father is running the grocery store, getting elected sheriff, serving as the coroner and then the undertaker business. And he started really early because you didn't come along for a while. No. <laughs> <laughs> My parents were rather old. I had a brother that was 13 years older, Judge Gail Robinson. And um, he was designated to be the only child, so we thought. <laughs> but when Mother was, I think she was 46, when my twin sister and I were born. And so you, we were complete surprises. Muriel and Maud, right? Muriel and Maud. Mm -hmm. And as, as a surprise as they were, how did you end up being a daddy's girl? Well, my daddy was so proud of having twin girls at his age that he wore two <laughs> red feathers in his hat. <laughs> and uh, he used to love for Mama to bring us to the courthouse. He was the sheriff. I think we were two when, when he was sworn in. And he had us standing on the top of the, of the uh, uh, court where podium. he was sworn in, the podium. We looked like two little cupid dolls up there in those little short dresses you used to wear back in the 40s. <laughs> and just looking, and he had both arms around us Aww. like that. And so I've got that, that picture still. And it has, has had several copies made, and I never know when it's going to show up, but it shows up <laughs> when I was two years old. <laughs> well. You grew up then in Old Hickory. In Old Hickory. And tell us a little bit about your childhood experiences, where you went to school, what kind of travels you might have taken, or hobbies that you had, because I know a little bit about your background. Well, <clears throat> actually, the Robinson family was originally from Old Hickory. When my mom and dad married, they lived there a while, but I was actually born when we moved to Madison. And uh, Daddy had built Mama a house on Gallatin Road, which at the time was a dirt road, if you can imagine that. It was a dirt road that ran all the way to Gallatin. And so uh, a nice house, and it had about 10 acres with it because uh, Daddy felt sure that his twin girls were going to want ponies. So we, we had 
ponies there. But we, it's a short distance between Madison and O'Hickory. You go down O'Hickory Boulevard, which turns into Robinson Road, and so you're there, there at home at the Robinson Farm in O'Hickory. Uh, so we went back and forth between those two places a lot. Um, but I went to Amquis Elementary School in Madison. Mm -hmm. I, I went to Madison High School for junior high and uh, t up until my sophomore year. And uh, during that time, uh, Dad decided that he was going to run for the legislature in the 60s. And uh, so we had to move to O'Hickory, and uh, he built a house on the farm there. So I went to DuPont High School and graduated from there in 1961. What kind of school activities did you have that you really liked? Well, uh, for one thing, I was a pretty good student. I, uh, I, I did very well in school. Uh, my twin sister did well in school, but she partied a lot. <laughs> She was, uh, really, she had fun all the time. I was a, the more serious twin, I guess. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I was a majorette in high school, and I liked that, and I played the saxophone. I couldn't even do that now, <laughs> nowadays, but I can't believe, but that's the instrument I played in the band. Uh, but I was into, in the beta club, and some, uh, didn't debate much. You, you would think, thinking you wanted to be a lawyer, that you would be on the debate team. Did you I want to be a lawyer in high school? Uh, I wanted to be what my daddy wanted me to be, and probably he hadn't really decided at that point. He needed ambulance drivers, but he got twin girls this last <laughs> go around. So, um, but like I said, he was a man before his time because he promoted women. He always thought women were smarter than men. <laughs> He really did, and he thought women could do anything, so he didn't care if we were twin girls instead of twin boys. He said, I can do anything with my girls that I want to, and so. How old were you the first time that you went to the funeral home that you can remember? I was there probably in my cradle. <laughs> I've been in the funeral home all my life. Uh, if mother had to go to the bridge club or had some event, the babysitter was the funeral home. The ambulance drivers took care of my twin sister and I, and we had a ball because they'd buy us milkshakes. <laughs> we loved to go down there, and, and, and what's, what is really strange, we have a different concept of death and dying. A, a funeral home brat, it is just like everyday work down there. You don't think a thing I about think, it. I think that's probably true. It, it is. And is mob Kind of like the same way with regards to the funeral home business? Exactly. She ran the funeral home most of her life, her adult life. She, she was the secretary. When you were little, home. how did you and Maude get along? We got along fine. We were known as the twins. You know, usually twins uh, uh, are known as, people ask, how are the twins? They don't ever use your name. It's a wonder <laughs> we knew what name we got. <laughs> But we were always the twins, and even to this day, the older people in Ohiku will ask somebody that knows, well, how are the twins doing? And, and how did the two of you get along through elementary school and junior high and grade school? Well, uh, we, our, our dad was not a strict par parent. He was the one that indulged us. Our mother was pretty strict. <laughs> she was a love, but she wanted everything perfect. She would clean the house every morning at 4 o'clock every day, but she'd clean it dressed up with earrings and makeup. So anyway, so, you know, we were always dressed up. Uh, we, we were on the farm and getting dirty, but she would always want us cleaned up pretty quick. So we got along just fine. But she dressed us alike, exactly alike, until we were in the seventh grade. And so <laughs> we didn't know any better. We were just doing what Mama said. But in the seventh grade, we noticed that people kept asking us, why are y'all always wearing the same? We didn't even look alike. We were fraternal twins. And so finally she gave in, and we got to pick <laughs> our own clothes. But we always got along fantastic. And we are very close to this day we, uh, when, on birthdays. We'll meet for lunch and buy each other the same present. Oh, dear. <laughs> it, it, that has happened at least on two occasions, and we don't know how that's happened, but a mental telepathy, I guess it, we, we don't know how that happens. But we're very close. Well, I knew you were, and you stay mm -hmm. in touch with her quite a bit. Oh, yeah. But as you said, she ran the funeral home for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. 
How involved have you been in the funeral home business? Well, I was really involved because I, I'd been down there all my life, and I, I, I used to be their counsel when I got out of law school. I handled all their uh, legal matters and bill collections and, and things like that. And uh, then I got my license later on, and so I'm a licensed funeral director. And uh, I did everything from uh, death calls, visitations, uh, just everything that, that's pertaining to the funeral business and and, and, and really love that because I, I'm I follow in my daddy's footsteps. I am a people person. I love people and I have fun with people. Tell me about those ponies that your father thought you might ride. Oh, they were all beautiful. But they'd all come out of the barn on two legs. I mean, they were not gentle. <laughs> and so I became a pretty good bronco rider there for a while. And I can remember when I was about nine years old, he, he had bought me a black pony named Black Beauty. And Black Beauty was not but about two years old, hadn't been ridden much, and she was a handful. And I was leading her out the barn one day, and I had a long rope on the halter, and something scared her, and she took off, and it threw me to the ground, and I was holding on. I couldn't make her stop, and, and this was a long rope. And I passed my daddy going along the gravel and the grass, and he said, let go of the rope, let go of the rope. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I let go. Of course, the, the uh, pony ran off. <laughs> but I, I was not as skint as badly as I could have been. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was one horse experience, but you have loved horses all your life. Oh, right? I, and I've ridden all my life. I still ride as of this day, and I'm How many almost do you have? 74. <laughs> How many horses do you have? Well, I'm down to two right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. Down to two right now. Um, did you do any competitions when you were in high school, horse competitions? I, I didn't in high school, but um, in my older years, I would show uh, walking horses. I, I had some walking horses a while, and, and I would show those. And uh, I, I did flat shot. I, I, uh, what is the, that? The plan that's where you don't have those built-up shoes. You show oh. your horse, which is a walking horse. God made the horse to walk beautifully by itself. And I would uh, show my horses in the um, uh, plantation class or the show pleasure class, as it was known back then. And, and I, I had an old Pride's Mountain Man horse that I bought out of my grocery money one day and didn't tell my husband at the time <laughs> that I bought this horse and uh, until he saw it perform, and then he was quite happy. But I did a lot of... Uh, uh, following the circuit, but if, when you're in the ho walking horse show business, you either do that on weekends or you don't do anything. It's very time consuming. So I got over that and I just trail ride now and ride around my farm. When you were talking about high school and being a good student, did you have any favorite teachers or favorite classes in high school? Uh, I had some uh, favorite teachers uh, that I really did like. Um, uh, uh, at Madison, I had a teacher, Lady Jane. We called her Jane Wright, and she was she was very good. And um, and then and uh, at Dupont, I had uh, Miss Whirly, and she was 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 very good. And, and I I was lucky to have a lot of good teachers at Dupont and Madison High, and I have to give them all credit uh, that uh, they taught me well, and I managed to make really good grades, and I learned a lot. And when if you're going to be a lawyer. You need to learn how to spell, and then you need to know how to make a sentence if you're going to write a brief. And I'm not the best at it, but I could spell and I could put words together. Good. So, um, were there any events that happened in high school that stand out in your memory as memorable, or um, the stories that you don't want other people to know? <laughs> well, I didn't really have any <laughs> terrific mi mishaps in. Uh, in uh, in school, either I, I can't, I'm so old, I can't all remember what happened in elementary school, but insofar as junior high and high school, everything went pretty smooth. I remember I desperately wanted to be a majorette. I was fascinated with that, and I was really good twirling the baton. Great, really good because I'd been taught by Sylvia Parrish. Some of you all may remember her from being around Nashville in the olden days. Um, so I tried real hard, and so I made majorette at, at Madison High School, and um, the band director, <laughs> I was a skinny kid, the band director suggested I drink half and half. 
<laughs> so I'd look better in my majorette outfit. <laughs> well, I would have done anything, so I did that. But anyway, the day I made it, I was so excited, I got home, and then Daddy came home with the announcement that we were leaving Madison and going to DuPont High School. So the very next day, I had to say, I'm sorry, but um, you're going to have to pick somebody else because we're moving. And that, that really... I thought, oh my goodness, I worked so hard for this. That was kind of hurtful, but I love my daddy, so, you know, that it wasn't, uh, bottom line, it wasn't an issue. So I go to DuPont, and as luck would have it, it was just before they had gone out for majorette at DuPont. And so I, uh, you know, display my baton uh, expertise and do everything perfect, and, and I get a position on the squad at DuPont. The only thing odd about it was that my twin sister decided to go out too, and she didn't know a flip about any of it. She just kind of twirled around. She made it too. So there we were, the twins, doing things together, both on the majorette squad. Uh, now, your father has these farms. He has a grocery store. He's got the funeral home. What did you do during your summers when you were a teenager? Well, you know, uh, we, we worked some. Um, we, we would work at the funeral home doing, you know, things like helping in the office and all like that. Uh, but when we got bigger, we would work at the courthouse. He, obviously, he, he was the um, trustee for a while. And so um, uh, if, if you know somebody that has an uh, office at the courthouse, you can probably get a summer job somewhere there. So, and I don't know whether that's the fact as of today, but it used to be back then because Davidson County and Nashville was a small town. Everybody knew everybody. Back so did then. you work in this courthouse? As I a, did. I worked in the trustee's office. Trustee's office? Mm -hmm. Way back when? Way back when, in the 60s. You've been in this courthouse a long time. I've been in this courthouse since I was two. Phew. Uh, <laughs> All right. As you're wa wor working through these summers, finally you graduate from high school mm -hmm. and you're off to college. Where'd you go? Well, uh, the first college I went to was UT and it was great. My sister went with me and uh, of course she, she was having a ball there. I was Now why is she always having a ball and you're not? Because I am a, more or less a bookworm, I guess. I was studying real hard and all like that, but I was a daddy's girl and I was also homesick, so I decided Knoxville's great, but I'm tired of driving back to Oak Hickory every weekend because I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to come back. I had horses. I had this and that. Did Mom so, stay? No, she came back too. <laughs> but then, then we wised up and went to different schools. So she went to MTSU, and I went to Peabody, and, and then uh, I went to uh, and I I knew it, it, after you know getting out of high school, I knew Daddy said, "Look, I need a lawyer." And then I need somebody down at the funeral home. And so I volunteered. I said, well, I'll go to law school because we had a brother that was a lawyer. So I said, right, I'll do that. Uh, about that time, uh, the gov Governor Ellington had appointed my brother as General Sessions Judge, so oh. Buford Ellington. Right. And so I um, uh, went to law school. And how did Maude feel about being in the undertaker business? Well, she loved it. That's what she knew. She was pretty, pretty much born there, too. So, you know, she knew she could handle that. And, uh, and she did a wonderful job until she retired uh, when uh, Judge Gail Robinson now mm -hmm. owns the funeral home. Now, your brother, who's 13 years older than you, when you're in grade school and high school, he's finishing college, going to law school, and he's out practicing, right? Yes, and uh, before he, he went to um, uh, Cumberland University for his law degree, and he, he went to um, Peabody, and he graduated from Duncan Preparatory School here, which was a nice right. boys' Nine school boys here school. In, in Nashville. And he, he was the little prince. He had all the hot cars and everything. He was a spoiled baby, and then he had to share. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a really good big brother because he had already been elected to the bench when I had started out. and so. Where did he practice and how did you get introduced to the legal community? Um, your father was the sheriff and that's one part of the legal community, but how did you get introduced to all the lawyers and what did your brother do to help you there? Well, actually, this was my mother's mother helping me do this because my mother 
uh, and Jack Norman went to school together, oh. Mr. Jack Norman Sr. And uh, it, it, it just started to be a tradition that the Jack Norman Law Office would always have a Robinson practicing in it. And Mr. Norman was very gracious because he always, uh, when, when he knew a Robinson was about to get a law degree, he always invited them to practice in the Jack Norman Senior Law Firm. How many Robinsons did he take in? <laughs> well, he took in Judge Gail Robinson when Your he brother. was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He took in Muriel Robinson <laughs> when I became a lawyer. He took in Philip Robinson when he became a lawyer, and he's now a sitting judge. And uh, he took in Philip, and he took in Gail Robinson. So that's almost like a family. <laughs> uh, that's right. And you know, um, Jack Norman Jr. was my law partner for many years there. And uh, when my brother, Judge Gail Robinson, died um, in 1995, Jack Norman Jr had his eulogy at the Almina Shrine Temple, and he said there is a tradition in Nashville that the Normans, uh, the Robinsons agreed that they would always start their legal career at the law office of Jack Norman Sr., and the Normans agreed that they would always end their career at the Philip Robinson Funeral Home. <laughs> and that's what happened year after year. Well, let's go back to Peabody. You, mm -hmm. you transferred back to Nashville, left UT, and went to Peabody. What was your major in college? Well, at the time, uh, I was majoring in political science of that nature just to get enough hours to get uh, into law school because back then, uh, you just had to have enough hours to uh, to uh, make application to the law school, and I actually got admitted to UT, or was going to UT. I think I'd gotten admitted, but I got married there <laughs> in the process, and uh, my mother thought, well, you ought to live with your husband, so I decided to go to the Nashville School of Law, and so that's where I went. So you got the hours from Peabody, and then went, went to hours UT? From U from UT, hours from Peabody, and hours from Tennessee Tech. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, when you started the Nashville School of Law, it was a night school? It was a night law school. And what were you doing in the daytime? Well, in the daytime, I was working at the Jack Norman Law Office. I was secretary to a very prominent attorney that had to be my father-in-law, Earl McNabb, and my brother, Gail Robinson, who later became General Sessions Judge, was also in that law firm, and so I was the secretary for both of those two. And I did legal work as their secretary, secretary uh, all the time I was in law school, so I had a great experience. Learning in the daytime and learning at night. Great experience. Mm -hmm. um, once you finished up at the Nashville School of Law, you got your, um, wasn't a JD then, when did you get your JD? I got that when, uh, that was in the 70s when, uh, when the uh, law school conferred that on all the graduates because uh, I, w I graduated in 1968 and passed the bar in 69 and went right to work in the Jack Norman Law Office. How many, and this is just a curious question on my part, how many women were in your class in law school? I think when I started out, and that's been a long time ago, uh, that they were probably five. And how many total in your class students? Uh, there were probably, I'd say, 55. So five out of 55? Mm -hmm. Did everybody finish? No, I was the only one that finished, that started out in my class. And that was a little bit different than college, I would take it. Um, well, yeah, quite a bit different. Uh -huh. I became the only girl. <laughs> <laughs> I became the pet, so to speak. But really what made me unique was that every time it would snow, I, I got to come to law school to class in the Red Angel from the funeral home. And Judge Joe Loser uh, taught a class there. And I think I'm getting this right. And 
when it would snow, he would look out the window and say, well, we've got to quit because uh, Miss Robinson's ride is here. <laughs> he would be looking down on, on the road and see the ambulance pull up. And that was my ride. Um, what were some of the things in law school that you found totally different, that you hadn't expected? Because you had a lot of experience working in the law firm. Mm -hmm. You'd been around your father as the sheriff, so you could see people who'd done wrong. Mm -hmm. And you knew about the grocery business, so you knew a little bit about commercial. Mm -hmm. what, what was it um, that you discovered when you went to law school that you really didn't know much about? Well, I guess um, what was more confusing to me, because you, you get a little bit of it in college when you take pre-law and things like that, but you don't get enough to really understand the subject. And so contracts was quite really involved. And uh, uh, Mr. J.G. Lackey taught me contracts, and he was an expert at it. But it was hard. And then the other subject that, that uh, that I thought I knew something about because I had certainly seen a lot of deeds and, and my family had a lot of real estate. But real property can get real confusing because when you really study it in depth, you have lots of different situations between owners and uh, deed transfers and things like that. And so I was really confused about that. I was having a hard time making A's in law school. And then just Overnight, the light bulb came on, and I understood it just like that. It just suddenly came to me. And, and, but I, I struggled with those two subjects. I, I don't know whether they were scaring me or whatever, but once I got into it, all of a sudden it became crystal clear, which is a good thing because when I was on the bench, I had a lot of dealings with contracts and real estate transactions, and, yes, sure. and real property was something you needed to know about. Um, when you were... Um, studying in law school, I had heard rumors about J.G. Lackey um, maybe not being as welcoming for the women law students as he was for the male law students. Is there anything that you sensed about that? Well, I didn't notice that, I guess, because I can get along with anybody and, you know, maybe he might have been grumpy sometimes, but I looked over that because my whole life I had worked mostly with men. Mm -hmm. And so that didn't really bother me. Um, but there was some talk around that, you know, that uh, maybe more so when more women applied because after I was there <laughs> being the lonely girl for my, for my class, there were classes behind me that were just filling up with women. So. Maybe that's uh, where it came from. But back in the day when, when I was in law school, I went to law sc school and and dresses and heels and makeup and jewelry and you know everything <laughs> and, and of course the dress code has changed as I understand it because I taught down there at, at the National School of Law for 21 years and I, I saw fashion change. Mm -hmm. Were there any uh, law school professors, you mentioned Joe Loser, are mm -hmm. there any that stand out in your mind as real characters or people who you learned a lot from? Well, I loved uh, Bert Haywood. I mean, he, he well, I think he was the real property teacher. He helped turn the light bulb on. <laughs> uh, he was very patient and kind and, and, uh, and, and very interesting. Most of the teachers down there I found to be very interesting. Now, the, ca the character was Charles Cosner, the bankruptcy teacher. But I loved Mr. Cosner because my sister worked for him as the legal secretary. <laughs> So I knew all about him, and he, he, he was a, a, a good man. He was. he was. He was funny. He had his ups and downs, but he was a great teacher. Well, mm -hmm. that's, he, he had a son who became a lawyer, right. Kenny Cosner, mm -hmm. yeah. in bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. I did not know any of the stories about Mr. Cosner, though, mm -hmm. but he was the character at the law school? He was the character at the law school, and we loved him because sometimes he would just... We would start out class, and sometimes he'd say, I just think that we just all need to go home. And we'd say, yes, we do. <laughs> this has been a long day, because most of the students worked all day. And then we had to be in class at 6 or 7 and didn't get out till 10 or 10.30. So it was, it was a long day for most of us. Now, you mentioned that there was a, a lawyer who was your father-in-law mm -hmm. when you first started. Mm -hmm. Did you meet 
your first husband in law school? No, I met him at the funeral home. <laughs> he happened to be a lawyer's son that needed a job for the summer. And I pulled in there in my white 1962 Super Sports convertible and asked him to wash it because that's what they were supposed to do when my sister and I wheeled in. <laughs> <laughs> and so he washed my car and then asked my sister out. <laughs> yeah. So how did that happen? I don't know, but she was blonde and cute. She looked like Sandra D. And I was dark headed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so how did you end up actually getting a date with him if he went with your sister? Oh, I had a plan. We both had dates one night in Old Hickory, and uh, I had a date with a, a banker <laughs> now. He wasn't a banker then, but a nice boy named Will T. Vance. And my sister had a a uh, date with Terry McNabb, which, you know, I was kind of wanting to date with. And so I got dressed up and all dolled up before she did. And I did look pretty good that night. <laughs> and I opened the door and let Terry in. And we had a little conversation. And so, and then they went off. And then Will T came and picked me up. And, and, and we had a nice date. And so about two weeks later, Mr. McNabb called and asked me out. So Isn't that something? Now, how did your sister feel about that? She didn't care. She was dating Stanley Bomar from Shelbyville, and he was the <laughs> FBI guy. <laughs> Much more so, interesting. Yeah, he was. <laughs> um, so did you and Terry practice in the same law firm? You know, we didn't. Um, uh, as, it, as it came about, unfortunately, our marriage did not work out, um, but we're still friends. Um, I, I, we call that the starter marriage. I guess so. I guess so. But one thing for sure, we uh, we buried um, all of Terry's family, and so we're still friends. And uh, I haven't seen him in, in a long time, but I understand. I mean, he's a great lawyer. He practices in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and his name's Terrence E. McNabb. I think that's his grown-up name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, uh, we we were friends, but it, it, it didn't work out. Work out. We were married probably five or six years. Uh, but uh, when he got his law degree, I think uh, Earl McNabb decided that he needed to start his own law firm with his son, which happens sometimes. And so right. that's what they did. And so I was practicing law with Jack Norman's office, and they. Uh, started their own law firm. And at the time that you got married, did you just continue to? Use Robinson, or did you ever become a McNabb? No, I, I became a McNabb, and then I had my name changed back because back then it, it was unusual for you not to take your husband's name. We had to wait for Rose Palermo to come along and say it's okay to keep your maiden name. And so um, uh, then I married um, a second time, and, and I didn't change my name either. The third time... I married um, Tandy Rice, and he was adamant that I take his name, so I used a hyphenated name, Judge Robinson Rice, because I was on the bench then. Right. And then, uh, when <laughs> this is the divorce judge having three divorces, <laughs> I know all about my work from, from having walked in the shoes of most people that come right. through my court. But um, I changed it back to uh, Robinson after the, the Rice um, divorce because I had so many opinions that it was getting complicated. And so... Um, Too much to write. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, um, all my opinions reflect Robinson. There is a gap where it says Robinson Rice, but, but they're all back to Robinson now. And now you're married to Irby. I'm married to Irby Simpkins, who's the love of my life. He's such a sweetheart. And... He had to kind of get used to his wife having a different name. But he had friends who were married to professional women who said, it's okay, it's okay. You're not any less married just because of the name. So he has gotten over that, and he takes it r really well. And most of the time when we meet new people, he, he introduces his wife as Judge Muriel Robinson, which is flattering to me. He doesn't have to do that, but I think he's kind of, proud every now and then. I think he is too. Yeah. Let's go back to when you got out of law school, starting in your practice. Mm -hmm. um, what avenue did you decide to go down when you were building your practice? What type of law did you decide to well, focus on? When, when I um, passed the bar exam, 
I really didn't know. I, I was a, a legal secretary in a law office, a very good firm, but I didn't know where I was going to be. And so I was late uh, working one night, and uh, I noticed that everybody in my law firm was gone or, or something was going on, but I, I was working, and so I didn't pay any attention. I worked like I, was, like I made grades in school. I devoted myself to whatever I was doing. And so Mr. Norman, Jack Norman Sr., came down the stairs, and our offices were in Printer's Alley. He came down the stairs smoking his cigar. He said, he always called me daughter because he'd gone to high school with my mother. <laughs> he said, call me daughter. And he said, come upstairs. Uh, uh, Miss Carrie and I need to see you about something. And so I go in his office, and if you're familiar with our law office, they have stairs that go come down in Mr. Norman Sr.'s office, and then it goes up to their beautiful apartments in Printer's Alley, which was the place to be back in the day in Nashville, Tennessee. So I go up the stairs, and everybody's up there in this table set with all this food, and I'm offered a glass of champagne, and Mr. Norman announces, I'd like to announce one of our new associates, Muriel Robinson. And they presented me with a briefcase. I mean, this was a surprise. And so I stayed right there. I just graduated from being the legal secretary to my own office overnight. That's so, a wonderful job history. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. and it, they were very good at keeping a secret because there I was. Well, mm -hmm. for those who are not that familiar with Nashville, tell mm -hmm. us how unique the location of the Norman Law Firm was. You mentioned Printer's Alley. Well, it is choice, choice real estate. It is right in Printer's Alley, which is world famous. It's where all the honky-tonks and the nightclubs were. And our law offices had an entrance on 3rd Avenue, but the back door went out into the alley, and you were right in front of the Rainbow Room. Mm. So uh, it, it was a wonderful place to work, a, a fantastic place. And for many years, on the back door of that alley entrance, I had a plaque that showed that I practiced law there, even when I was on the bench. They just didn't want to take the plaque down, and finally they remodeled the building, and the plaque went somewhere. I don't know. Did the Norman and law firm and you uh, find some work off of Printer's Alley? Of course, we never know. We never knew what was coming in the back door, <laughs> and uh, well, anything could come in the back door. Sometimes we had people come in the back door that we had to call the police to get out. <laughs> But um, it was a learning experience, and, uh, and I loved working down there. And I had some great law associates down there. I had um, Mr. Norman Sr., Jack Norman Jr., Judge Seth Norman, uh, Raleigh Woodall, uh, Earl McNabb for a time, um, Herb Rich, one of the most fantastic members of the bar. Um, just lots of great people that I worked with. Let's take a break right here. Okay. That my sweetheart. Yes, yeah. since he just came in. Muriel, when you started practicing after this uh, surprise briefcase board, mm -hmm. um, how did you make the transition from being the secretary, the legal secretary, to being the lawyer? What, what did you need to do mentally, and what did your colleagues need to do? Well, I didn't have much time to think about it. <laughs> I had jumped right in uh, trying to act like a lawyer. I remember one particular day, pretty early in the uh, start of the practice, that uh, I was going to try a jury case with uh, Judge Seth Norman when he was a practicing attorney. And it was in Third Circuit Court. And, or no, take that back, it was in Judge Harry Lester's court, Second Circuit Court, and, uh, <clears throat> or it could have been Dutch Ullion, maybe, let's go back to Dutch yes. Ullion, Judge Dutch Ullion, because uh, it's been so long ago, I'm so old. Uh, and so we go in there, and he's, he made the opening uh, uh, statements to the jury, we had the jury seated, and I was sitting there with the counsel table, and he turned around to me as he sat down and said, I'm leaving, you handle it. And so there I was, two days <laughs> at a, passing the bar exam <laughs> with a jury case on my hand. Uh, but 
fortunately, we muddled through that, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I can't even remember what happened, but I know it wasn't bad because it didn't stick in my mind as a situation that, that was memorable. Right. So, but things like that, I, it was kind of like being thrown in the swimming pool, and you're either going to sink or swim. And so I did, I did a lot of general sessions work, and uh, that was uh, pretty cool uh, because by then my brother was general sessions judge, and of course I didn't try cases in his court. But um, usually, you know, the other judges were very nice and all, and I started out with contracts, uh, uh, co debt collections, and things like that. So general sessions was, was a big part of my early legal practice. And, uh, but the, the, the one problem that I used to have being a young lawyer, and, and back then, like I said, we, uh, women lawyers, we, we dressed in suits and wore high heels and did things. It, it, is I would go down to jail to get my client out or at least talk to them and I couldn't get past the clerk uh, they, they'd ask me who I was I, I said I'm Muriel Robinson I'm the attorney for this person and it was like no you're not an attorney you know because you're a female and and it was a little different then and I said well what what will it take for me to 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 be able to see he said I I don't know, but, you know, we don't know. We don't know whether you're a lawyer or not. And I said, I've got an idea. You call Judge Gail Robinson and describe me and tell them that there's a lady that says she's your sister and she's here to talk to an inmate and see if he'll agree to this. And so that's what they would do. And finally they would recognize me. And, I, and then there was no problem. But right there off the bat, it was a little testy uh, because you, you don't want to alienate anybody that your first time doing business with. So it was, it's like, think of some way that you can get this done without making anybody terribly mad at you. Right. So Now, you were doing a variety of types of cases yes. at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you do any in the surrounding counties? I did. And uh, I didn't have much difficulty when I, I became known in Nashville because my people were here. But when I would go outside of my little comfort zone, uh, sometimes it was a little challenging. Uh, like uh, at docket calls. At docket calls in the little surrounding counties, they would um, have a docket call day and you would go and you would sit there and you had the chance as they called your name out to set a case or whatever but they would put all the women at the bottom of the list so we had to sit there all day long and it was like you know the the men's work is important because they've got to get their cases set and get out of here because they've got more things to do so we'll make the girls wait and so we were always at the bottom run but that's okay. I made a lot of friends. I was the last girl sitting there. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's something you had to do because you had to get a court date. And now it's so much easier. You just ask for money and they give it to you. Um, how did you go about building up a practice? Well, uh, of course, family would send me business. That was good. And then it got to be a word of mouth because I got into the niche of the domestic relations area of the law. And I had some expertise in that because that's what I'd done as a legal secretary for um, Earl McNabb, who was one of the prominent divorce lawyers in town for many years. And, and then um, being in the Norman Law Firm, th they did everything. They were criminal lawyers and they did a lot of domestic work. But uh, just word of mouth, and, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have a really good rapport with the other uh, domestic relation lawyers at the bar. Some of them I had gone to school with, but some of them were older people that, that knew the family and that actually were very helpful to me in my career. And we had two judges back then that handled the divorce um, litigation, and that was Judge Benson Trimble, who was on the bench for many, many years. And then the probate judge, who also tried domestic cases, was Judge Shelton Luton. And they were both fine judges, and, um, and I really enjoyed my practice in their courts. Uh, they taught me a lot, uh, and you've got to be willing not to ever get mad at the judge for whatever he does, because he is or she is the judge. Uh, but they were um, very kind 
men that, um, that, that they wouldn't let a young lawyer win a case because they were just a young lawyer. They wanted you to learn. And mm -hmm. if, if you did something wrong, they wouldn't embarrass you. They would say, maybe you ought to do it this way or, or something. But I was fortunate enough to have those two and met, were in their courts on a daily basis for the, probably the first 16 years before I ran for office. So, When you started practicing, you were the, the sole woman graduate of your class. How many women were practicing when you came to Not many, practice? Uh, the, uh, but the ones that were there were very helpful to me, and, and they were all my friends. Uh, of course, Sissy Daughtry, you know, she was there. She was a prosecutor. And the first time I saw Justice Daughtry, she, she was the prettiest thing to me. She had on a gray wool dress and a cute little bob haircut and pearls and spike heels. I bet they were five inches high. And she was a knockout and just cool as she could be. She knew all the answers and everything. And I thought, hmm. That's that's a good role model right there, <laughs> and so we, we were we were friends, and I followed her career, and of course she got right to the top, you know, and and, uh, and then there was Asta Underwood. Yeah. Y'all are too young to probably remember. remember Asta Underwood, and um, Kay. What was Kay? Thomas. Kay Thomas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was treasurer of the bar. I, I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kay Kerbel. Becky Thomas. Kay Culbertson. Kay Culbertson, that's yeah, right. Right. And Becky Thomas. And Becky Thomas. And now, Becky Thomas was a friend of my father's and did business with the trustee's office a lot because she was she was probably the grand dame of the Nashville Bar because she was around by herself for years and years. Uh, but there were some, some older ones that were always very helpful to me and that I actually liked. And then another one that was just invaluable in my career that I, I didn't see too much, but when I went in her court, I always loved to be there, and that was Judge Ruth Kennard, the bankruptcy judge. She was just a nice person. Just a wonderful lady. Mm -hmm. You're right. And of those women, they were here when you got out of law school. Mm -hmm. How soon after you got out of law school were there other women lawyers coming along? Well, uh, Gail Pig, remember Gail Pig, she was uh, a very prominent and really good real estate lawyer and all. Um, I, I noticed being a member of the bar that more and more women were going to law school and there were more that were passing the bar exam. So I wasn't lonely for too long because they all, you know, started uh, coming in. And, uh, and there were, I think the the uh, the male bar had to get used to us, as well as as the judiciary. Now, uh, the the Nashville judges seemed to get with the program pretty good, but they were all southern southern gentlemen. And if you can remember Judge Henry Todd, who was a great man, he taught me in law school. His favorite saying to a woman a woman lawyer was "little lady." <laughs> which didn't go over too well because he didn't call the adversary little man. <laughs> no, he didn't. But he didn't mean anything by that. If there was ever a gracious Southern gentleman, it was Judge Henry Todd. And so I, I told him one day, he called me, he said, what am I doing wrong? And I said, well, it's kind of a new day, Your Honor. I said, I know we're, I love to be a Southern belle, but some women don't. So I would suggest that you do not try to open doors, and you don't call anybody little lady, just call them by their name. <laughs> he says, okay, I got you, I got you. Um, as you are going through this practice of 16 years before you ran for office, your brother became a judge, right. your father ran for sheriff, mm -hmm. you said he was the trustee, and he was also in the legislature. Mm -hmm. What was your involvement in politics? during all of that time. Did you help them? Did you just watch on the sidelines? How involved were you? Well, I was really involved because the women folk in the family were the ones that got everything in order <laughs> for the candidate. We would work the polls from sunup to sundown. Uh, we would get the donuts for the poll workers when you used to could do that. We would uh, get the car geared up to take people to vote and take them back home because a lot of it was, they needed transportation. So we, we did that. We, uh, you know, it, 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 at our funeral home, the top of it was like a, a war room. We had, we had precinct maps and everything. And um, 
uh, we just, the women did all the work, and so that's what we were supposed to do. And when I decided to run for office at my dad's suggestion, it was a different role for me because I was always a person behind the scenes, uh, getting the vote cards out, getting the pamphlets delivered, beating the streets, you know, talking to the neighbors. I mean, I, I would start it with a neighborhood and do blocks and blocks of knocking on doors, asking for votes, and, and then, of course, you... You uh, called on the telephone when that got popular, and then, and then you could buy the voters list from the um, uh, register's office, and, and, and it progressed, and you progressed with it. And uh, so I, I had a lot of involvement behind the scenes in all those elections, and I had an uncle that was in the legislature, Rob Robinson, right. which is Judge Philip Robinson's father. For he served for I think thirty-two years or so. So. So there was a lot of family background in politics. You have that experience going on. You're practicing law. How long was it at the Norman firm before you became a partner? Well, we weren't a partnership. We were associates. We all had our own law practice under that name. Uh, so we were not. It was not really a partnership. We all brought in our own clients. We sh would share clients sometimes if we brought in a client, we would associate with one of our associates to work on it if we wanted to. But basically down there, you know, everybody had their own practice and their own set, set of clients. And, and what did you discover about your work habits and your colleagues' work habits in the office? Well, it seemed to me I was there much more than, than my other fellow associates because I would go in at 8 o'clock and sometimes not leave till midnight because I wanted everything done. Of course, I didn't have staff there at midnight, but I had everything ready to go for staff in the morning. Uh, but, uh, of course, that was before I married uh, my second husband and, and uh, had my precious Kathleen Gale. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I, I spent a lot of midnight oil there. How long had you been practicing when Kathy Gale came along? Oh, I had been practicing probably uh, about, mm, probably almost 10 years. Uh, she was born when I was 30. And so um, I had, well, probably about seven or eight years into the practice. Mm -hmm. And having a little girl is always a wonderful thing, but when you got married, you had more than one little girl, isn't that right? Well, yeah, the second time, uh, uh, Kathy Gale's father had uh, six children, six girls, uh, five girls and one boy, and then Kathy Gale was number seven, <laughs> and uh, made the six girls and one boy. That's a big change as far as... Uh, yeah, I was a single practicing attorney with no cares in the world, but just, just myself and being able to work at midnight if I wanted to. Well, the world changed after that. <laughs> and, uh, Tell how it changed for you. Well, I had, um, uh, we had a farm in Gallatin. So I had uh, 12 horses in the barn and seven kids in the house and a law practice in Nashville. So I got up early, did all my farm work, cleaned stalls and everything, uh, fixed seven little sack lunches I had a baby in a high chair here that I would drop off at daycare and I got to uh, my law office about 8.30 so I could be in court at 9. And I did that religiously for years and years. And fortunately, I never had any kind of really bad crisis that would happen that would cause me to be late or anything. I don't know how lucky I was, but I had good help. And uh, the times that, uh, that the baby, of course, before she got in daycare, I, I had great help that helped me... Uh, with with her while I, you know, went to work, and then and then the kids, they got older and they started driving, and that was a big help. But I tell you, sometimes having to leave a law practice at three to get everybody six, six little girls to um, right softball practice and everything was a little little hard. But we did it, and and uh, you asked me about all that. And I can tell you right now, I don't know how I did it, but it was accomplished. I I can remember when you were doing that. Yeah. I, I can remember Kathy when she was just six and on the campaign trail with you. Oh, yes, she was. Mm -hmm. um, given all the juggling that you were doing, did you have much time for the funeral home during that time? Well, I, I did, mainly because it was on my route coming in from uh, Gallatin to Nashville. 
there was either a stop on the way in or a stop on the way out for different sort of things. And I didn't have to go every day, but I did devote one day a week out of my law practice to their legal work, and I would go down there and, and handle that on site. So, uh, and, and that worked out, you know, pretty well. And, and there again, the uh, funeral home happened to be my Kathy Gale's babysitter, so very convenient. And my twin sister used to rock the cradle <laughs> while she was down there. And uh, so that worked out rather well. Now, does your twin sister have children? She does. She has a son. His name is John Garner Hopkins. She's married to a man named Roland Hopkins. Right. And uh, you might know they own Fate Sanders Boat Dock in uh, Laverne. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a great, great guy for a brother-in-law. Still got him. I, you know, she didn't have to trade him in. I had to trade some in. <laughs> few models here. And... When you are having Kathy Gale, when did she have your nephew? Well, now he's six years older, almost seven years and older Kathy than Kathy. So she had a baby much earlier than you. Yeah. The twins mm -hmm. didn't do things. We didn't do that together. That's right. Mm -hmm. So Kathy comes along. You are an instant mother uh, quadrupled or mm -hmm. whatever six is plus. Yeah. And... Keeping your law practice going. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with all of the demands on you? You said you don't know how you did it, but it's obvious. Well, it helped that there were six girls and one boy instead of the other way around. Yeah. Because the girls were very, very good. And when Kathy Gale was born, I can remember being at the hospital and having all those little faces pressed up against the nursery looking at that new baby sister. And so I was in, the, actually I was in court the, the uh, day before she was born and I was trying a case before Judge Benson Trimble. And then, I, you know, that night I was at a basketball game at Vanderbilt and went to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, having arrived there within two hours, I had a bouncing baby girl. Uh, but Judge Trimble, it, Red O'Donnell, the newspaper columnist, did a little thing. Some judges do different things. This judge has got a baby girl and put in his column, and so Judge Trimble was reading Red O'Donnell column, and he called me in the hospital, and he says, Muriel, I, uh, I'm reading here. You were just in my court yesterday, but I'm reading here in the newspaper this morning that you've had a baby girl. And I said, oh, yes, she's so cute. Her name is Kathleen Gale. And he said, well, uh, I didn't realize you were expecting and I said, oh, well, you have just confirmed, Your Honor, that you never really pay any attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a good laugh, but I didn't gain any weight with Kathy Gale, so That's... nobody really ever knew. And I was so busy with life being as usual that I didn't mention it to a lot of folks. So, Well, but... you had little Kathy Gale. I brought her home from the hospital and handed her over, and she had four other mothers. Uh -huh. the, from the, there were stair steps, and they all knew how to take care of the baby, and it's a good thing because Mama had to go back to work. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you. How long was it before you were single mom again? Well, it was about, let's see, uh, Kathy Gale was probably six or seven years old when uh, I divorced my second husband. Right. But mm -hmm. unlike a lot of divorces, you ended up with all the children. I did. I did because um, their mother uh, was deceased. Mm -hmm. And so I, I told my husband, who was being, being very reasonable because he knew I had a good relationship with his children and he knew I would take care of them. And we are still all very close today. And so uh, all seven stayed with me and I took care of them all, sent them all to college. Uh, they are devoted to me, and they're devoted to Kathy Gale, which is a little strange because Kathy Gale obviously is my biological child, but there is not one jealous bone in anybody's body in that group of siblings. And you did a lot for your extended little girls, that family. You incorporated them into everything that you were doing, including coming to the courthouse, right? All right, right. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I have one that, that was my court officer and my secretary at the courthouse for a long time, and uh, 
it, when that happened, we had the little thing called the nepotism statute, which you didn't want to violate. But no problem there. I was not married to her father, so it didn't really <laughs> count. And so, uh, but she has been a loyal employee for judges of the Fourth Circuit Court for, gosh, almost, I'm thinking now, about 25 to 30 years. And uh, so smart, we always called her Judge Parks. <laughs> and that's my stepdaughter, Brenda Estes Parks. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other girls, what did they go off and do? Well, then we had another one, Dawn, uh, mm -hmm. Dawn Estes, that was... Uh, uh, my secretary for many years, and uh, and then she decided that she probably would like to work somebody else for somebody else and get a different side of the world, and so. Um, but but all of my children that I raised are very very successful, um, <laughs> and being a judge's child, you have to watch your p's and q's, and they all did. I never had a child arrested. About the worst thing they did was three of my daughters in one night got stopped by the same state trooper coming in <laughs> when I lived in Gallatin. And, and I, one came in and said, Mom, I'm so sorry, I got a ticket here. And I said, okay, put it on the dresser. Next one comes in 30 minutes later. This is so strange, but a state trooper stopped me and gave me a ticket. And I said, I've got a collection going there, put it down. And so the third one came in and said, Mom, I had gotten a speeding ticket. And I said, Okay, just put it there, and because uh, we all had to go to General Sessions Court, you know, for it. And she said, but it was so strange because the policeman came up to the door, and, and I rolled my window down, and he looked in, and he said, haven't I stopped you twice before? <laughs> and she said, no, sir. And uh, <laughs> they all look alike. And so uh, he had a good laugh. He was in, in there to prosecute the tickets, and, and so I was their lawyer, and so we kind of worked all of that out. But he said, I swear, I kept stopping this same kid. I thought it was the same one, but she had a different car every time. <laughs> so. so let's talk about another lawyer in your, your life, mm -hmm. Kathy Gale. She is a great lawyer. She is, and she chose to go to law school. And uh, she's loved it. She was a uh, um, she was a uh, uh, started out at Waller Lanston here in Nashville, and then uh, she made partner at White Terrett Combs in uh, Memphis, and uh, so she's done really really well. She retired to raise my two grandsons, which are uh, Garner Yulehorn, thirteen, and Warwick Yulehorn, which is eleven. Any chance they're going to be lawyers? In the future? There's a big chance their dad's a lawyer, <laughs> Gil Yulehorn in Memphis. He's, uh, he's, he does real well. He's with Beth, Be Beth Berry and Sims. There, okay. So. Well, let's go back to where you were before you ran for judge. You're practicing law, and you've explained how you've been uh, married, had a little one, and then inherited uh, 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 mm -hmm. six additional ones, and you are taking care of the horses in the morning, children right before breakfast, out the door, back at night. And you said your dad, now your dad's still around encouraging you, helping? Yeah, he was. My, now my mother passed away um, uh, about 10, 10 or 12 years before my father did. But my, my father was very supportive and, and he really loved all my little stepchildren. And, uh, and so I, I had good, good backup if I needed it. I was just fortunate enough to never have to call on anybody. I, I practiced a lot of law and had a pretty good practice when I decided to run for office. And, uh, but everything worked out really well because at the time, uh, in 82, when I decided to run for the Fourth Circuit Court, uh, my children that were in college were out and they had good jobs and I was getting an empty nest. And uh, so it wasn't difficult to make a transition then. I, I had sold my property in, um, finally in uh, Gallatin. Uh, and that, that happened, I believe, after I was on the, on the bench. But I had a residence in Nashville here because I was here and uh, my jurisdiction was here. So uh, it, things kind of just kind of fell in place and I didn't have any difficulty making that um, uh, little transition. But it was a new world because I was I was then single and uh, my daughter went Kathy Gale went to Swanee and she was off at college and uh, and 
it, it was it was a lot different going running my campaign and then being an elected judge because before that I was you know going to different counties around national practicing law and whatever and by then there were so many women lawyers that you didn't have the difficulty in even the smaller counties that you used to that weren't used to right. females uh, practicing in their court and but I, if you, if you go to the country you'll notice that they don't have many. Um, Oh, female judges in some counties, like Bedford County does not have a female judge. Uh, hopefully, no pretty soon they might have one. I don't know. But, but when you ran the first time, Kathy Gale was six. Mm -hmm. And I, as said, you took her on the campaign trail with you sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you said that your father encouraged you to run. Now, here you are with all these children, your practice, and your dad comes to you and says, oh, I think you should run for judge. How much busier can you be? Well, and I was 38 years old, too, at the time, and I had a really good law practice built up. Right. Um, and a lot less to do because the children were about grown. But he called me when Judge Trimble announced that he was not going to seek re-election. And he said, um, this is what you need to do. He said, you need to go by Kinko's and get a photograph made, and you need to take it down to the pa paper, to the banner, <laughs> and to the Tennessean, and announce that you're going to run for judge of the Fourth Circuit Court. And I said, but Dad, I've got a good law practice here. Uh, do I have to do it right now? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe next time. And he says, no, it's an eight-year term, and you're 38. Now is the time to do it. So, you know, being a daddy's girl, I mean, I always followed my dad's advice, and it always got me to where I wanted to be. So I wasn't going to argue with him at this time. Matter of fact, I never argued with my father because I thought he hung the moon. And so he had a plan in mind just because he read the newspaper. And so that's what I did. Did you have an opponent? Did I ever? I had three. They were all great guys, uh, but we we had quite a contested race there in 1982. Do you remember who they were? I do. I think I do. <laughs> One was Clive Lee. One was Jimmy Vance. And the most formidable one was Thomas O. H. Smith Jr. So, and then me. And uh, so, uh, and then John Doak. That's right. Yeah, so there was a bunch in that race, which was good for me because I could hold my votes together if they all came together like we thought we had. You know, I always got reminded that, that we had the old Garfinkel Robinson political machine. Well, I never found it. I wish they'd <laughs> told me what basement or closet they put it in. I never found it, but I. With that many in your race, if, if you do have some kind of base somewhere, and I certainly had a base in Old Hickory and Madison in East Nashville, because you know East Nashville really used to elect all the politicians uh, until Nashville didn't uh, came had gotten where they had a lot of people coming in that were from different places and all. It wasn't such a close knit right. community anymore. Uh, but that was quite a race, and I. Uh, uh, I would go to, uh, during that time, I'd take Kathy with me sometimes. I, you always want the union vote, and I would go to all the union halls. And, and, and it was amazing to me that they were really astonished that a woman was going to run for office. And they would ask me, why should they vote for a woman? And I said, you know, you can vote for who you want to, and it doesn't have to be male or, you know, it can be male or female. It doesn't make any difference that it's not male. Uh, but I would ask how many in here have been divorced, and everybody would raise a hand, just about. And then I'd say, how many have remarried? And all the hands would go up, and I said, how many of you all are supporting another man's child? And boy, that just really brought the... <laughs> and I said, that's why I want to be judge. I, I feel very strongly that parents ought to support their children, and I know if you remarried a lady with children that you're probably not getting your child support. That's right. Well, I'm going to fix that. So that was what I ran on. With we needed to enforce the child support orders. When you were running, what did you find the most difficult thing to be? You had a lot of political experience. So what was the most difficult thing? Well, you know, 
time was managing time was the most difficult thing because you didn't have enough time to get every place you wanted to be. Uh, but fortunately for me, uh, even not even knowing that I would one day run for office, I was a joiner. You know, I, I love people just like my father did. And I was a member of a lot of women's groups and clubs in, in Nashville, like BPW, Business and Professional Women's mm -hmm. Club, and uh, just just a, a, a lot of clubs. And I went to, at one point in my life, I had a meeting every night that I, that I would go to. Altrusa, I was a member of that for many years. Uh, Ladies Hermitage Association, just lots of civic, in, right. in women's clubs that, that provide a base, base for you. If you do anything at all, you make friends and they're going to remember you or whatever. So that was easy. So I didn't, I didn't really find anything too terribly difficult except managing your time to get around to every place you think you needed to be. It was difficult being a female because you would get criticized for it. And it was a fact. You couldn't change it, so you had to make the best deal out of it you could. And so <laughs> I can remember one time I, I was meeting with somebody who was giving me some political advice and, and they said, now when you go to these places and you meet these people, do not, don't drive your Cadillac and don't wear your fur coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, but that's not me. And I said, besides, my fur coat and my Cadillac are paid for by my own self. I worked hard to get that. And so he said, I give up. <laughs> you know, drive what you want. I said, well, it will always be American made. <laughs> so, When you were running, you had to raise funds to pay for all the campaign expenses. Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me about the fishbowl. Well, fishbowl. Fishbowls were always good for me because I ha always had a problem asking people for money. I just did. <laughs> And so instead of you sending something where it costs you $50 to come and see me so I can ask you to vote for me, I would rather invite you and feed you good. And then if you were interested in me being a judge, just put it a little something in the fishbowl. And so, and, and I raise money all the time. And I, I ran three uncontested races and, and didn't even ask for money and it came in. And so I had to keep that little thing going it, all the eight years because I'd use it for the next time and you know I, I finally uh, you know shut it down when you uh, think this is your last and you're going to file your final report and you know you've filed them like I have it's kind of crazy you're not supposed to know who gives you money yet you have to sign the paper saying that these figures are true <laughs> so that's always a little odd but uh, I can remember when I ended up at the end of the of the thing and I was trying to close out my campaign fund I gave most of it to the Humane Society here in Nashville. And I did that because I thought, you know, I love people, but I love animals too. They, they never cause a problem for me. Now, while you're practicing, while you're on the bench, do you still have your horses? I do. All I do. that time? You're All that time, I, I've always. So when did you sleep? Um, well, uh, usually from about midnight to about six. A.M. And, and then, but you have to realize that I could get from Gallatin to Nashville probably in 20 minutes back in the day. Back in the day. Now that's impossible. It's, it's, it's more like a probably, I hadn't driven it lately because everything's changed, but it's probably a good hour and 15 or 30 minutes right. to make that trip now. It would be, my life would be impossible <laughs> today if I was trying to do what I did back Sounds impossible 30 years even ago. now. Mm -hmm. um, when you ran, you won, and you were the first woman elected to a court of record in Davidson County. Correct. That makes you pretty exceptional. You become a member of the judiciary. How many other women judges were there when you joined the ranks? Barbara Haynes, she was elected to the uh, General Sessions Court. Right. And, of course, Sissy Daughtry. But she was at the appellate level, right? Right, she was at the appellate and level. Barbara but was just in Barbara and, and myself, and, and now Rose Cantrell had been appointed. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, she, um, and she ran for office, uh, but she was defeated by Judge Walter Kurtz. Right. So when you went so, to the judicial conference, oh, statewide, was, how many were there? 
and well, of course a record. Well, of course, for the judicial conference, the appellate people would be there too. So I had Sissy. Okay. Sissy Daughtry was there, and and myself. And so I can remember that first judicial conference I went to, it was a little touchy because when I got there, I could hear the talk. Well, they, they've gone and elected a woman judge in Nashville is going to be here at the conference, and they were just kind of whining about it. <laughs> but uh, I, I brought them a bottle of Jack Daniel and said, here, guys, <laughs> and that kind of <laughs> said, well, she may be an okay girl. So we all hit it off, but it, you'll have to know that in 82, this was really the time that a, a younger female went in with a, a, a judicial conference that was, that was a lot older than she was. Right. You were 38, right? I was 38, and I had uh, uh, their guys, their judges there, like Wythe Chandler from Memphis, and, and much older than I was, but they were all just very gracious. And, and once they got over the shock of having to, to uh, have a, a female at their conference, because it had been a, strictly a, a, a male-dominated thing for years and years and years, and this was really something different for them to kind of see how they're going to work with. Uh, and so, uh, but the, the women that were elected started trickling in pretty fast after I got in. So they finally got over it and finally realized how wonderful we all were. So, uh, and I believe if you would take, num take notes and names at the conference nowadays and that you would see that, that there, there are so many women in the conference now that a lot of times at some of those meetings there's lots more females than males right. there. You get to the bench, you're newly elected. Not only do the judges have to adjust to you being a woman judge, but now you're looking out at an audience that this is the first time they've seen a woman judge. Correct. What experiences did you have with regards to that? Well, the women were delighted. They, they were, their little eyes would light up when I'd pop out there. The men, not so much. Now, the lawyers had already accepted this to be a fact, <laughs> but the litigants didn't. And I can remember I had to be pretty stern sometimes because my forte was let's collect the child support. And when I would put down an order, I'd had to have a male litigant say, you can't do that to me. I said, well, this is what the law requires. And when I would sentence one, because they just wouldn't do on, on a contempt charge that was the way it had to be, and uh, uh, put them under a sentence and ask the bailiff to take the prisoner into custody, they would look at me and say, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. I said, put the bracelets on. And they would put the bracelets on. And, you can't do this. And I said, well, I'm duly elected. You violated the court order. You have a right of appeal, but for right now, you're going to jail. And they'd say, well, I really don't think you can do this. And I said, why not? Because you're a woman. I've had people say that to me. And they'd say, well, you know, women get elected to office too. So, and then, you know, that, that probably went on for about six months to a year, and then finally, you know, Word gets around pretty quick. Look, this is the judge. She's a woman. She wants you to pay your child support. If you don't, you know, you either pay or stay. Right. So. And I, I, as you um, got settled into the position, one of the things that you had run on was enforcing child support. Mm -hmm. Did you find that there were other things that you did different than Benson Tremble in the way that you handled the divorce court? Well, Judge Trimble uh, was a great jurist. He, he did um, for many years, and uh, but it, it seemed like the child support orders were not keeping up with the times because the divorce rate was getting larger and larger. Uh, there were children uh, that, that, were, that could not be raised on the court order, three children, 25 a week. It was unrealistic. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I think that the uh, domestic relations law as it dealt to custody and children and child support was kind of bottom rung. Uh, male judges, they, 
they'd rather do anything, I think, than try divorce cases because they have a heart and they're sympathetic with women and children, but they don't know how to fix the problem. And there is something about, well, if you put a man in jail, how is he going to get a job or go to his work to, to even support this? Well, there, there are ways to do that, and so we had to figure, figure them out. So we went through a, a time right in 82 when the child support orders were so low they were ridiculous, and the collection of it was non-existent. And so our welfare rolls were bulging because all the state was giving the money and didn't have a, a way to collect it back in. So that was one of my uh, really big challenges was to uh, raise these child support orders and actually have an effective way to enforce the orders, which we started off, this is the way it's going to be, and I think over the 27 years I was there, we, we followed that pattern, and, and the collection of child support skyrocketed. We, we, at the at end, of, end of my term, when I retired, we were collecting over $46 million a year in child support, which was really unheard of before somebody finally said, let's get these um, uh, child support uh, orders adhered to and let's change the law. And of course, I have to thank Washington for that because under the 4D program, they changed that where we could intercept the uh, tax refunds and mm -hmm. we could uh, apply the wage assignments. So things are getting better. Did you ever have occasion to go up to the General Assembly and ask them I did, all the time, and, and you know, uh, I'll, I've always said, and this is my line, that we're all in danger when the legislature meets because it's always over before you know what's happening, and you need to get up there and tell them before they do what they do, but um, I, I would have to close my court down and go up there because some of these hearings were, were so very important on, on divisions of properties and on the amounts of child support and, and upon actually... Uh, the, the power that the court needed because so many um, uh, lawmakers ceased to be lawyers and, and uh, as a result the judiciary was suffering because you almost have to be a lawyer to see what impact these laws have on the judiciary. Right. And so I had, we had to educate people at some of those hearings on how it worked because they didn't know. They'd never been in the courtroom and so they didn't know and what works and what doesn't work. Well, what works is judicial discretion because one law or uh, principle cannot be a cookie cutter thing. It does not fit all family situations. So you've got to have a little wiggle room there. And so when we stressed that, that was fine. We kind of tweaked everything, and, 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 they, and of course they had to uh, comply with the federal law, and uh, especially on those with, wage withholdings and the uh, income tax refunds uh, that they attached. So I think it's gotten better. Uh, but as I, as I look at, at, at things that I see now, I, I see things coming down that are going to be problematic, but I'm not here to worry about them, but I really feel for the judges that have to enforce some of these things. When you first started hearing cases, there was a new grounds, irreconcilable differences, mm -hmm. which made it easier for people to get divorced, but custody was still um, being litigated quite mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. and. There were occasions when people would want to bring in the child psychiatrist or some counselor for the child. Um, you seem to have a pretty good grasp of family dynamics and had, I guess, some little unwritten rules about how the testimony would come in. How did you develop those? Well. Um you know, you learn as you go. Sometimes when you're a new judge, you are a new judge. You can't do anything about that. So you do have to gain some experience. And, and uh, having heard some of the witnesses, you see who you don't need and who you do need. And uh, I, I came to the conclusion that the less people we had involved in these two strangers that you don't even know is marriage and the rearing of their children, the better off we're going to be. But uh, then, uh, of course, the lawyers have a responsibility to do the best they can for their client, and if it means hiring an expert witness, that's fine. But it all boils down to a matter of money. And once you get involved in something like that, too many mouths to feed in the lawsuit, and it never works. I mean, you cannot, one side can afford it and one side can't. So what do you do about that? So I started kind of whittling down the witnesses that I knew I needed to talk to. Not everybody. Uh, in their custody case needs to hire a psychiatrist or a psychologist. 
because I found in my experience that the children at the time of the divorce were saner than the parents. <laughs> uh, I could get the truth out of a child. I couldn't get the adults to tell the truth one way or the other. They wouldn't agree on the color of the rug. But uh, children in their innocence tell you exactly what's going on. And so, and you can tell, if you hear these cases enough, as a trier of custody cases, you can tell who is the fly in the ointment. You can tell which parent is trying to alienate the child and what it's doing to the child. And it just kind of comes naturally with the, with the job. So I, I just set up on a course to let's leave out all the professional people if we don't need them. If we need them, then we've got to have them. But what happens when one side can pay for it and the other doesn't? Well, then you have to have a, a way to figure out that both are entitled to have competent witnesses to uh, present their case. Therefore, the one with the money may have to contribute to the other one uh, and able to uh, let he or she um, have appropriate representation and appropriate uh, scientific uh, evidence if they have to ha hire an expert. So that's the way you kind of do it, uh, but, you, but you have to be conservative because, you know, the courts are pretty much closed to people without money, and that's why I think the Supreme Court is, is addressing the uh, justice situation of that uh, to have a remedy for all to get in when they need it. You came in, you had an existing caseload. Judge Trimble had been a little ill before he left the bench. You had to catch up on that caseload, but how did the work that you did on the bench increase over the years that you were there? Well, it, it, we're in an urban area. Uh, the Fourth Circuit Court was busy all the time, and we held court every day, so there's going to be a lot of volume through there, but we did have a system, and I think by the time I left, when I retired, there were probably, uh, the Fourth Circuit Court was probably trying four to 5,000 cases a year. Uh, didn't a actually have to try them all, but that's the volume of paperwork that went through, and they it was either settled or. And I found if you were consistent in your rulings, that cases would settle. And I know we had a lot of that, and uh, uh, it, it became that the fact that most of the lawyers knew what the judge would accept and what she would not, and so it was easy to agree on a parenting plan that was acceptable and and, and move on. But there there were cases that were quite difficult that had to be tried and it took a lot of time and took a lot, a lot of work to, to figure out the best solution because number one, in these cases with children, the, the best interest of the child has got to be paramount over either parent, but parents don't understand that. So uh, it, it took a lot of work keeping the court open to get those cases through. I think your reputation as a hard working jurist uh, still stands and the number of cases particularly in domestic relations, is impressive. Um, do you recall any significant cases over the time that you were sitting on the bench that either impressed you or had a lot of notoriety? Well, the, the cases with the notoriety were the ones that I remember that I wish we did, didn't have to go through that, but we did. And, and if you're a judge, you can't certainly pick and choose what comes through your court. You have to deal with it. And a lot of times I'd have members of the bar say, why don't you just recuse yourself? And I said, that's not what I was hired for, to recuse myself. I've got to stick this out. And, you know, it's not that, because a judge tries the case and you don't know these litigants. You know, they're not your friends, they're not your family, or you wouldn't be trying them. <laughs> they're people that are looking to you to, to, to use your judgmental expertise and figure out a way that they can get untangled from each other. But if you, if you um, uh, order something that doesn't appeal to them, then they can turn on you in a minute. And I, I, I was in several of those situations, uh, one of which was the Lynn Anderson divorce, which was very problematic because Lynn, uh, we got caught up in the media. I couldn't say anything, but she could. So she said the worst things about me, and, it, and, and they would be published in the papers. And, of course, we don't re really believe everything we read in the papers, but some people do. Oh, she, could, she could explain herself, but I couldn't because I was a trier of the fact. And so I, I was 
on a trip somewhere, and I got in a cab, and, and the cab was laughing. And he said, look at this, Battle of the Blondes. It happened to be me and her as the two blondes battling over her divorce case. And I'm thinking, thinking oh, please. And, uh, but we, we saw that through, and uh, uh, she was, uh, some litigants are, are difficult, but if you're persistent and you follow the law and, you know, this is the way it is, she did go to jail on my watch, and she and I uh, usually took people right from the courtroom, but she needed to straighten out something in her career, and so I gave her some time, and when I asked her to appear to start serving her sentence, she was late, about to the tune of two hours. But anyway, she did have to serve her time, and, and uh, then really everything got better. And then, then I had some professional, usually doctor cases were a little problematic because sometimes doctors and lawyers don't, don't mix, and they think they know more than, than the judge. But, you know, when you're involved in litigation, the person that knows the most that you shouldn't tell, even if they don't, is the judge. So... When you had this large caseload, what would you do if you ever got to the point where you had too many cases working with your colleagues? Would there be other judges who would step in and help you out? Well, they probably would if I insisted, but I knew that they didn't want to try my type of litigation. And so uh, what I did was I had a brainstorm one day and I decided to hire uh, Jack Norman Jr. is my special master, and that was uh, a brilliant idea that I had. And he had been a member of the bar for 50 years and knew exactly everything there was to know in domestic relations court, so he proved to be probably the best special master any court could ever had. I mean, he saved the day. He, he could settle a case while I was trying one and uh, come in and and if he got a settlement, we didn't want it to get cold. <laughs> he would give me the thumbs up. And if he did that, I would stop whatever I was doing, take a recess, and say, call your principals up and let me hear the terms of settlement. And we would grant it right then. And it was so wonderful. And I, I accused Jack, as my special master, of having a jar of pixie dust that he kept with him, that he sprinkled it on all these litigants that would not agree on the time of day, and they all came together and had a reasonable settlement. Uh, but he was a master at that, so. Well, you slipped in a him. word, I think, earlier, and you said, you know, if the judge is consistent. Mm -hmm. um, how do you define what you did as being consistent? What do you see that you did was consistent? Well. Uh, I, I had rules that I wanted the lawyers to follow, uh, the, all the rules that we had to follow, that were the law that we had to follow, we'd follow those. But there's some things that work in divorce litigations and some things that don't. I, I think, you know, uh, when we're discussing visitation, you know, the standard visitation in Judge Robinson's life and in her court is every other weekend from Friday at 6 to Sunday at 6, one day during the week from 6 to 8, and... Uh, you know, uh, alternate holidays, birthdays, and let's have extended summer vis visitation of at least a month or more if you can agree. And, and that, was, that was my standard thing. And lawyers would tell their clients, this is what she's going to do. She's not going to do day for day. She's not going to do week to week. She's not going to do month to month. She's not going to do year to year. I can't say that I never did any of those things. But I felt like being consistent on what I would approve was much better. Now, there were some that, that after telling the parents when we had to do the parenting plans that this little thing they'd come up with was not going to work, they said, okay, but just let us try. And I did that on one or two occasions, but it never worked. So they were always back in there. So I think the lawyers knew exactly, I was on the bench so long, they knew exactly what I was going to do they could tell their client is if they were reading my mind because I could see them when I gave my ruling, they'd turn around and say, see? <laughs> and it, so that helped them settle their having case. Having been there, I would agree. Yeah, right. Now. Having, having settled their case or, or uh, you know, it, it worked. We knew what worked and they knew what worked and what didn't. What did you find to be the characteristics of a good trial lawyer in your court? 
well preparedness and that's a hard thing for a judge to get every day 24 7 you do not get it because you know we're dealing with different people and and different ways of thinking the problem uh, about the problem and different ways of trying to solve the problem so nobody thinks exactly like you do so but all judges like for lawyers to be prepared to try their lawsuit and it just doesn't happen a lot of times. You know, we have great lawyers and we have lawyers that aren't so great and that could be great, but they're not prepared. So I think if you if you took a poll of judges, they would tell you what's the number one problem with, with the bar as it appears in your court? Being prepared would be my answer. Uh, but I think it's getting better, you know, because I think I think most, I could see a change in my life uh, as, as lawyers, young lawyers came in and as they aged and they got with it and they knew what to do. But there's always going to be a list of lawyers that a judge prefers to be there because you know everything's going to be done right. And if you can get two of them as adversaries, it makes it wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, the world's not perfect and lawyers aren't perfect and neither are judges. Talking about not perfect. There's been a, a move afoot to try and get TVs in the U.S. Supreme Court. How would you feel about TVs in the proceedings that you conducted? Well, uh, I, you, even a court reporter changes the way a judge judges. I can't imagine a television in my face all the time because, you know, we're human. Sometimes we say something that maybe we shouldn't have, and I, I think that would just be so much not fun because you'd always have to uh, be mindful of, of what's going on and that every little word you're saying is, is going to be recorded. And me, I'm not able to come out with anything, you know. And most of the time when I do, it's said in jest or fun, but it might be taken a little bit differently some way. So... Uh, I would think that would be a very bad idea, but then again, the world is changing and it's just like the cameras for the police. You know, that may be a lifesaver on the difficulty we've had in everything in the past couple of years, but then again, if you don't turn them on, they don't work, you know, and it, it just it, it just seems like, I, I'm very protective of judicial discretion and I think that would just be one more you know, nail in the coffin of taking away judicial discretion to have TVs in the courtroom all the time. Let's take another break and I'll come back with some more questions. Muriel, in making your decisions, you usually ruled from the bench, but there were times when you would have to write an opinion. Mm -hmm. How did you approach that? Well, um, when I first went on the bench, Mr. Norman Sr. told me, daughter, rule from the bench. That way everybody knows that nobody got to you in the back room. So I thought, that's pretty good advice. You know, what they get is what they're going to see. And so that's what I did. But there are occasions when something's very complicated or you're dealing with numbers and whatever that you have to take time and recess and you have to write an opinion in your chamber. And I've done lots of those. They were called memorandum opinions and they were uh, issued and sent to the lawyers and then the lawyer was told to draft an order and include that memorandum. So uh, I did that um, a lot, but I really, really tried not to have to take anything under advisement. I think reading from the bench when you can is the best way to, to do it. <clears throat> no one really keeps a tally, but if you had to estimate the number of times you were appealed and the number of times you were reversed, what would those numbers be? I was lucky. I wasn't appealed very much. Uh, I, I, I hadn't counted. Last time I counted, over 27 years, I may have been reversed 40 times. Excellent. A Excellent. lot of times there were remands back to do something else, and you know, but I had a great, a great appellate record, really. Now, some of that uh, uh, could have been that that, that there were frivolous appeals and they weren't going to change them anyway. But I was lucky that uh, because I would religiously read those opinions when they came back because I wanted to know what the trial judge erred in, and uh, I found that I wasn't 
reversed a lot, and so I didn't err much. <laughs> Family law usually involves a lot of stresses for the individuals that are involved. Mm -hmm. Children, if they're involved, it's always um, a concern for the court that, as you said, the best interest of the child be observed. Uh, were there instances where you found that the children should not be, custody should not be given to the parents, maybe to the grandparents, and how did that come about? Well, I'm, I'm sure there has been uh, a time, uh, out of all the cases, I can't remember them all, uh, but, uh, that, that the parents were not the way the court had to go. It just not was not to the best interest of the child, so you have to make another decision. Um, I can't recall the uh, custody awards that I've made to grandparents, but I know there have been some. Uh, usually, uh, I did not have to declare a parent unfit. That was my last resort. But I, when I had to do it, I could do it. And the most famous case that I have for that was the Baby Crystal case um, out of, um, well, it was in Davidson County and Rutherford County where the baby's throat was cut and she was placed in a garbage can and uh, garbage bag. And uh, those two parents desperately wanted that child back. But the proof was that I mean, we've got to, it's amazing the child lived. The emergency room doctor saved that baby. And to my understanding, she's, of course, she's grown now and thriving. And every once in a while, a case like that, they'll write me a progress report and say, well, she's married and graduated from high school or she's going to college or whatever. Um, I, 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 that's that one. I think though that family eventually moved to Colorado. But I, I had gotten recently a letter within the last five years from a girl, who I, I terminated her parental rights, and she thanked me for that. And she, her, her foster or adoptive parents told her what had happened to her, and she said, "You may not remember me, but I had a broken leg and broken ribs and this and that and whatever, and you saved my life." And she just wanted to thank me. She told me she was doing well. And uh, she said, I just feel compelled to write this letter. So, but those cases are just heart-wrenching and they're not easy and, and they're, they're tough to decide. But when bottom line, best interest of a child, I'd rather err that way any time than take a chance on parents that have proved not to be successful in their parenting. Well, let's go to a little happier part of family law and that's the adoptions. Real happy. Mm -hmm. Tell us about those days. <laughs> well, part of the Fourth Circuit Court's docket uh, once a month was Adoption Day. And to me, that was a big deal. And um, I, I dealt with surrender, surrendering parents. We, we cried. We, we did everything in chambers. I had Kleenex and everything. And, and I always told a mother who, who thought that this was the best, that she give up the rights to her child. I said, only you know that. I tell you, but you have to love them enough to give them up. And that seemed to make them feel better because they couldn't take care of them. And I said, you, you are doing right by your child. Don't ever criticize yourself for this because you're loving this child enough to give it a chance mm -hmm. since you know you can't give it a chance. So, so and I, I think that helped. Guilt is a lot of weighs heavily on parents that are surrendering. I have to say that women, of course, that bore the child or the, have difficulty in giving the child up. Um, the, the, the fathers that came in who really had no relationship with the mother and never seen the child, they, they were very easy. They just wanted to sign the papers and get out of Dodge. So, uh, But adoptions were happy days. Fourth Circuit Court made Adoption Day happy. We had pictures. I'm in so many wedding albums and birthday <laughs> albums and things, adoption day with all around the judge with lollipops and everything. And I did start a tradition, I think it's still going on in this court, that um, everybody gets a lollipop that day. And uh, a lot of times the lawyers would ask for them. <laughs> you have a saying about you can marry them, divorce them, and bury them. Correct. I mean, full you have even mentioned that on a number of occasions you married a lot of people. I've married a lot of people, and uh, I can't imagine how many count. I've lost count way back then, but that's part of a judge's duties. And now some judges back in the old days would charge, and they would kind of 
hang around the lobby down there catching the new, newlywed wannabes come in. Uh, but they kind of put a stop to that. So you can go to any judge's office and if they'll work you in, you know, it's part of the judge's, elected judge's duty to, uh, or appointed judge's duty to, to marry, because that's on our, our list of things that we need to do as a service. How, however, you don't accept money for it. And uh, a lot of judges did back in the day, and it was okay because that was the practice, but we know that that's not to do. But I always had people wanting to give me money, and I married a lot of folks in my chambers. And so the bride and groom would come in, and, and uh, we'd have the ceremony, and then the groom would ask me, how much do I owe you, judge? And I'd say, about $50. And so they'd get out $50, and I would give it to the bride and say, take him to dinner. So that worked really well, and so they all had a good laugh about that. And of all the people that I've married, I've had very few come back that divorced. And, and if I married them, I would probably um, send the case out to another judge because I don't like to untie my knots, really. <laughs> um, we talked about some of the changes in the law. There were um, new requirements for... Uh, setting child support, new requirements on the parenting plan that came about. Did you have any cases involving surrogacy where um, the parties had come to a parting of the ways and yet one or the other of them were not a birth parent and have any problems in that regard? Uh, you know, I, I, I maybe had one or two cases like that uh, where uh, uh, the closest to it would be where there was a, a stepfather that married the mother when she was expecting the baby and he had been the father but wasn't the biological father but had a, established such a, a relationship with the child because they raised the child and then there was the biological father that came in midway and wanted to assert his rights and, and, and all like that. And we had some cases like that and I think the last one that that went through this court that I can remember that, that they had a meeting of the minds and so they both decided to parent the child. And so uh, they just they kind of buried their hatchet and said this child can have two dads. And so that worked out. I, I really didn't have too many where it was so convoluted that we had to get into that much. Now, you know, there was a lot of legal ramifications about the, being the biological father and being the father that's actually done the job of rearing the child. So uh, there's been decisions on that both ways. So, How would you describe the changing attitude, society's attitude, towards um, women in the law? and women in the courts, whether they're judges or whether they're lawyers, at the time, over the time that you've been? Well, uh, I, of course, when I started out, you know, there were very few women, and, and, and the, we weren't readily accepted, but since that's been over 30 years ago now, and uh, so I, I think that everybody expects them, uh, women, to be at the forefront of all of this, because in some instances, I've opened up court and had no one in there that was male. <laughs> other than the litigants. I mean, I've had the whole bar there working that day were women, so I don't think anybody notices it anymore. That they're just, um, we're just all there. And how would you describe the difference in practicing law versus being a member of the judiciary? Well, I think it's a lot more fun being the judge. And, uh, you, because you don't have to take all your phone calls, you should talk to your clients and nobody calls the judge. Nobody's supposed to call the judge. I'm not saying they don't try, but they don't get to judges. And so uh, it's easier in that regard. It, it's, it's nice because if you're the judge, you have a wonderful staff that does everything for you. It's kind of like your own little kingdom there. But it's hard work when you do certain things. Like I, I probably wouldn't have been a very good chancellor because of all the uh, uh, figures and meticulous uh, uh, trials that one has to have being uh, s situated in the state capital here. Uh, I would probably not be very good at that, but because my court dealt with um, uh, the divorce litigation and domestic relations and adoptions and things like that, I interacted with the people a lot, so that was, that was good for me and, and pretty easy for me uh, to do. And of course, a judge 
the, the things the judge has to do that a lawyer doesn't, a lawyer has to prepare your case and you have to do it good and you have to have your pleadings in proper order and you have to file your uh, orders on time and your motions and everything. You really have to know what the court rules are. The judge kind of kind of sort of knows all the court rules because they've got all the books and, and, the, and, and they keep up with the changes and all because they're told by the conference uh, what's all going on and it makes it easier because we don't have to dig it out like a lawyer does. It's presented before us. Uh, but what a judge has to do is to maintain the integrity and demeanor in the courtroom, which is sometimes gets a little touchy when the litigants are so obnoxious, and lit litigants can be obnoxious. So you have, to, you have to keep your cool. Now, if you don't, you probably lose your bench. And you have to remember that. I used to have a little note that says, above all, be nice today, <laughs> because... They will try you, everybody will try you, and even the lawyers try you, but you, 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 you've got to remember that you are the judge, that you've got to maintain and uphold the integrity of the court. So even though you're flustered and would like to wring somebody's neck, you cannot do it. And you cannot really be a Judge Judy in real life because uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, nowadays, on every facet that you go through being a lawyer judge or anything like that, there are all always is a department of complaint that you can go to and file a complaint against a lawyer, against a judge, or whatever. And every time that happens, you have to stop what you're doing and file your affidavits and explain yourself. So the best way to do that as a judge is smile and keep your mouth shut, but be forceful with your orders. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the interactions that changed when you went from being a lawyer to being a judge your interactions with other lawyers and with all of these organizations that help put you in your position. Well, you know, I still was involved in a lot of things after I went on the bench. And, I, and of course, being a lawyer, all your friends are lawyers, generally. <laughs> and uh, so well, how do you do? Well, I used to tell my friends, uh, you know, best friends in the courtroom, uh, you probably wouldn't try your best friend, but but I have lots of friends that are not really close friends, but they are my friends, and I consider them my friends. And and uh, as I say, most of them are lawyers. But I would tell them, I said, look, you're my friend, but in the courtroom it's a little different. I'm I'm the judge, and you're the lawyer. So if your facts are good, you'll do very well. But if they're not, you're going down the drain like anybody else that doesn't have a lawsuit. <laughs> So that's just what I said, and, uh, and sometimes it would get a little testy. It was hard on me to rule against somebody that, you know, that, that was my friend, but you know, I got over it because this is factual. This is not personalities. This is, we got to deal in facts in here. And so that's the way I handled it, and if they, if they ever got mad at me, they'd have to get glad because I wasn't going to change my stance on that. Well, I think you've been on the bench maybe 11 years, and you were selected as one of Nashville's most favorite, you were Nashville's most favorite judge in 1993. I don't know how that happened, because in my job, half the room is mad at you. But we did engineer a lot of compromises, and, and even today I'll run into people who say, you're Judge Robinson, aren't you? And I'll say, yes, who are you? And they'll say, oh, I'm such and such. Remember, you put me in jail one day. And I said, oh. And he said, but I needed it, <laughs> you know. And he said, and I want you to know that my ex-wife and I have a really good relationship. Of course, our children are grown now, but, you know, he said, I, I was mad at you at the time, but you were a pretty good judge. I can see why you did that to me. And then <laughs> the next year, for two years in a row, you were one of Nashville's 100 most powerful individuals in town. That's okay. amazing to me. Uh, uh, I, uh, Nashville's favorite judge, I knew that that was conducted, uh, I believe, by Nashville Scene, I don't, I don't know, or one of the magazines, one of the, and, and I knew I was kind of in that, but I never expected to come out on top with that because all I could think about were the ones that I'd really made mad in the courtroom, so I thought, this is not going to work. But I, I was very much flattered by that. Now, the, the hundred things, uh, it, you know, I guess as a judge, people think judges have power. And lay people that are not lawyers think judges have power. Uh, and they do to some degree, but it's all combined in following the law, and it's all constitutional what you have to do. So it's, it's a little bit, bit different, you know. We may be powerful because we read the Constitution. 
Well, I think it's to your credit that after you had been on the bench over 20 years, maybe just 20 years, you were named one of Nashville's 25 most beautiful people. Most people That who, is a stretch. <laughs> most people who are on the bench don't um, either maintain their looks or uh, they lose their looks, but you have just continued to improve. Even today you could make, you know, 25 most beautiful in Nashville. Oh, well, you're very kind to say that. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's just like being a new, uh, a new um, baby lawyer. You know, I always thought if you wanted to make an impression, you should dress nice and you should wear your makeup. Uh, don't let them see you without it. <laughs> and I've tried not to do that. But um, uh, I, I have to attribute whatever I, I, I have going for me here um, is that I, I've never been sedentary. I work all the time. I'm constantly moving. And, and I, you know, I get up in the mornings and um, put on my makeup, do my hair. Uh, now, I'll have to admit, sometimes it goes up in a ponytail. <laughs> But I think, I think even if you're going to the grocery, look your best. And uh, people respect people who try. You and Dolly Parton. Yeah, and, and you know it's just like uh, I used to uh, attend. I used to uh, conduct or be a guest on the inter interview or speaker for the Bridge the Gap seminar that we used to have, and yes. I don't even know whether they still go on. But I would tell all those female lawyers that said, "Look." Do you know what a female lawyer looks like? They've got on a dark suit and a white blouse and maybe a little string tie and clunky shoes. I said, don't go there because you all look alike. You don't want to look alike. You want to stand out. So with that black skirt, wear you a red jacket and, you know, and put on some spike heels if you can walk in them. Don't break your leg or anything. But people will notice. And nine times out of ten, your adversary is going to be a male. And he's going to like the way you look. And oh, by the way, I used to say this to my male adversary, and we'd have a case that it would just, you know, it was turning us every way but loose, and we couldn't agree on the time of day. And I'd look at him in the eye, and I'd say, you know what the best thing about this lawsuit suit is? And he'd say, no, what? I said, you. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd just melt. He said, okay, what do you want? <laughs> I said, we need to do this well, and this and this. <clears throat> That's practicing law. Let me ask you, what is your judicial philosophy? And could you say that it evolved over the years? And that's question number one. And question number two is, how do you feel about judicial activism? Well, I'll have to say that um, over the years, I, I learned more patience. I, I started out not being a baby judge, and, and uh, it was quite different because I went from lawyer immediately to being judge here. And it didn't always work the way I thought, and, and I thought, this is, this is crazy. But I had to learn to, to be patient. And if things didn't go your way, you don't get mad about it and spout off in the courtroom. You, uh, you say, well, well, let's try to work this out, or I have a different opinion, and, 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 and this is why I have a different opinion. Uh, don't get angry. And if, if you have to address a lawyer, <laughs> dress down a lawyer, do it in chambers. Don't embarrass anybody in the courtroom. And I'll have to say that early on, I, I probably have embarrassed some people in the courtroom, but I've been embarrassed myself by, lit by litigants yelling back at me. And so what's a judge to do? You've got to maintain control of your courtroom, so at some point in time you're going to have to take the reins and take over and not have any disruptions in your courtroom. And if you have to have the bailiff handcuff somebody or you know, hold them in contempt or whatever, you must have the fortitude to do that. Now, other thing, once they get used to you, you know, you can always, killing people with kindness will get you there with every time, even if you have a volatile litigant in there that, it, that every word out of his or her mouth is just something you shouldn't be saying in the courtroom. If you handle them in a respectful manner, they'll eventually quit because they know that they're not getting to you. But it's hard. It's, you have to change personalities when you're in the courtroom. You have to be tough on occasions, and then you have to be mellow on occasions. You were talking about speaking to Bridge the Gap seminars. Mm -hmm. 
there came a time when you were on the bench that you also became the first woman lecturer at the Nashville School of Law back to your alma mater. Right. And mm -hmm. I don't know how that came about. How did you end up being on the faculty at the Nashville School of Law? Well, let's see. Um, after I was elected in 82, I mean, two days after I was elected, I got a call from the law school saying, we have an opening, would you like to come in? You'll be our first woman. <laughs> and I'll say, well, okay, when is it? Well, it's Thursday night for so many times. I said, okay, I will do that. I will do that. And, and uh, um, that, that was... Um, now, who made that Judge vocal? Loser. Judge Loser. Okay. Yeah, Dean Loser. And so, um, uh, and, and you know, when I practiced law in Judge Loser's court, uh, he was a really, really good friend of my deceased brother, Judge Gail Robinson. And Judge Loser, he was a tough judge, though. He was a smart judge, and I liked Judge Loser, but boy, he could really, really be a tough judge in court. And, and, uh, and I... Um, I had been bruised every now and then in his court, but I knew that was just part of the job, so I didn't take it personally. So I was surprised when he called me and said, do you want to be on the faculty? And so I, I didn't want to do that because I thought, well, this is great because most of the lawyers that go to the National School of Law are going to end up in my court, and so I will have them ready just to be DR experts. So uh, it worked out really well. And then we were on the board, and, and he had some really good ideas, and, and we were kind of allied because I thought his ideas were good, and I didn't give him too much trouble on the board, you know, there. And, and uh, so it, it went, went, went really well for all that time. And, and the reason that I felt like that I needed to do that, I needed to stress uh, to the males that, um, that there were going to be women lawyers, and, and the school was crowded with, with uh, women students there. And so everybody had to learn to uh, think that each other was going to turn out to be a successful attorney. And the way to do that is to show everybody what they can do in, in the courtroom. And, and we used to, we'd have a really good time. I taught adoptions and I'd have a skit. I'd have parents there giving up children and parents there accepting children and they were adopting each other. And so it was a fun thing. <laughs> Uh, we did cases like that. We had uh, we had divorce litigation where I married two of them there, and then we had to divorce them, and so it was kind of fun, and, and I think they enjoyed that. And then um, teaching, I, I was one that, that when I taught, I you know I, I memorized things, and I can do lists, and I can remember things, and I thought, well, they'll remember this, and uh, if I give them the test questions, I'm going to give them. 40 questions are going to be on the exam, but I'm only going to really put 20 on there so they'll know more than they think they know. And then I'd give them cases to read and say, you know, probably 15 of these 30 cases are going to be on the exam. Well, they had a lot to do and a lot to do. But if they did what I told them, they'd have made an A. And most of them did. You know, they did. I would have to say that the female students did much better in that environment than the males did because they read all the cases and they, they knew them. But... It How many years did you teach? 21. Now, you haven't lost me because I remember your daughter was six years old when you first ran, and then two days after you got elected, you're teaching on Thursday nights. Right. Mm -hmm. So your dad encouraged you to run. You had to do that for six or eight months, mm -hmm. busier than ever because you still had to practice yeah, until you were elected. Well. Um, how did you find that you were able to juggle all of your children, and Kathy Gale, teaching at night, the horses in the morning, the, the lawyers during the day, how did you manage that? Well, let's see. Uh, the way I did it, I had really good help at home, but I would try to get home because I was the cook. I, they they like my food better than the, the help's food. Uh, but but I did all that, and then as they as they were aging out, they weren't there, and and of course I, the, Kathy was the one I was tending to mostly during that time. Uh, she was the last one, obviously, at home, and so um, uh, I had her uh, with a competent person while I was teaching. Cause I didn't teach every night, but I was at the funeral home, and then she was in college a lot of that time. And um, of course, I was free as a bird then. I really had an empty nest, and so I would go from the courthouse to the funeral home, and I would work there until midnight thereabout. And then I'd uh, uh, work every night there except 
on Thursdays. Now, if we didn't have any visitations at the funeral home some nights, I didn't have to go in, but mostly we were pretty busy. Um, so I taught on Thursdays, and it was just once a week, and, and, and that, that's what I did, and it ran for um, half a year back then. And so we, I did that for 21 years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. But you also did other things in addition to the schedule that I've already set out. At one point, you were doing Talk of the Town or a little interview, not Judge Judy, but something about the law. Mm -hmm. There was a program that you appeared on on a regular basis? Right. Yeah, that was once a month, every third Tuesday, and I still do that. And what's that called? Talk of the Town. It's, a, it's like a public service. Um, and the reason that came about, right after I was uh, um, elected, um, Tom Irvin had called me to say, you know this Ju Judge Wapner on TV? And I said, oh, yeah, I was just dancing with him in Las Vegas or in uh, Reno last week because we go to the Judicial College. And he was our banquet speaker. And he was the cutest little judge ever was. I think he's probably deceased by now. But uh, he loved all the little women judges were there that were there at the, at the Judicial College. And he wanted to dance with all of us because he loved to dance. And so we all danced with Judge Wapner. So anyway, I was telling Jack Irvin that we, I was just dancing with Judge Wapner, and he was just a very nice person. And uh, he said, well, we want to do, put a judge on our talk of the town where, where you can ask, uh, answer questions, and we just think that we need something like that. And so that was, I'm still doing it. I've been there 33 years now, doing it every third Tuesday of the month. So that's why we have judge sightings in Kroger and Shelbyville, Tennessee. <laughs> What is um, your most memorable event on the talk of the town? Probably had several. Most memorable, memorable event. I mean, oh, I well, this is kind of a crazy little thing that happens. You know, when you, when you, uh, if you're a woman, you've got a lot of clothes in your closet, and so one day I cleaned out. Uh, all my ball gowns, <laughs> you know, you, we went to all the, the balls and, and uh, here and you, you had to have these gowns and then you wouldn't wear them. I kept them a while and so cleaned out my closet and sent them all to um, uh, Goodwill. And so I was on um, talk of the town one day and they were modeling clothes. They were modeling clothes that you got at Goodwill or Ladies of Charity or someplace. And so <laughs> Uh, I think it may have been uh, Mary Hance was showing you where, well, her models had on some of my dresses. <laughs> and so it was kind of like meeting myself, <laughs> you know, there, there, there was my dress. So that was kind of funny. And then uh, one day uh, they, were, um, they were having uh, some kind of dance contest and all. And so uh, um, Debbie or one of the, the, the co-anchors with me that were doing the show said, Come on, Judge, let's see you do the whatever it was, dance we were doing. So I was there dancing around uh, uh, without any warning. <laughs> you know, what do you do when you're asked to dance a certain way on, on the network? Well, you do. <laughs> we don't sit there and argue about it. You just get up and do it. So I'm spontaneous anyway. You never know what I'm going to do next. One of the things we've talked about is the impact of your legal career and your judicial career career on your family, the children, your dad, mm -hmm. but you've been married to Irby Simpkins for a while. What was the impact of your judicial career on Irby? Well, you know, Irby uh, is the love of my life, and uh, uh, people were pretty shocked when we got together. But we just, we just really hit it off, and, and it was really fun when Irby had, uh, had asked me out. There was the publisher and the judge going to these parties that you dress up for. And so it, it was great for me because I knew half the room. He knew the other half. So uh, talk about uh, a power date. A power date with Irby Simp Simpkins, publisher of the Nashville Banner, was a good thing for a judge that was running for re-election. <laughs> So uh, he was gracious enough to squire me around a lot of places. And so um, anyway, so, uh, but I, I really didn't want to get married. I, I said, do not mention the M word. I, I told him that right off that, I'm, you know, I'd been married before and I, I just wasn't going to consider matrimony. And so, so we dated a while and, and <laughs> the, 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 
funniest thing that he did, he said, I'm going to mention the M word. And I said, well, don't do it. And he said, I, 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 really, I really think that you're the one I want to marry you. And I said, well, I've got to think. And so he said, well, why don't you call your twin sister and her husband, which he loves, and uh, let's have dinner tonight. And so I said, okay. He said, tell him to come to Abbotsford. That's where he lived. And so I went there, and I said, they'll be here at 6 o'clock. And uh, so, um, so we were there. Uh, waiting for them to get there, and we were sitting in his lovely home, and he got down on one knee, and he pulled out a velvet box, and he said, will you marry me? Opened the box, and there was a beautiful ring. Got it on. And just as I opened my mouth to give some kind of answer, the doorbell rang. So it was my twin sister and her husband. So we get up, and I hadn't said anything. <laughs> and we go to the door, and we open it up, and Irby is tearing up, and I looked at them and I said, yes. <laughs> and they said, what's wrong, what's wrong? <laughs> and I showed them the ring. So uh, that's how he knew that uh, I would marry him even though I didn't want to get married. <laughs> he staged everything, even to the doorbell ringing at the, a time which I had to say yes. <laughs> because I didn't have time to say no and explain anything. So that was 17 years ago, so we're still going strong. <laughs> if you had to um, describe what you feel to be your major contributions as a jurist, what would you say they were? Well, uh, my life's work was trying to get parents to support their children, and I uh, I hope that the two judges that pretty much took my place, since we now have two operating domestic relations court instead of one, um, that they would uh, continue uh, to collect this child support in the appropriate manner and stick to their guns about it because it's so important. You know, uh, children need, they need both parents, but that's, that's the ideal and it doesn't work in real life. They need the support of both parents, and it's very, very hard for a child to go to school hungry and all, and so I just wanted the, uh, we have good support laws, we just need to enforce them, so I hope they keep up my legacy of uh, uh, so enforcing these child support orders and seeing that the children are educated and provided for because our children are our future. And Education is the most important thing along with child support. We have to have them educated and parents have to be responsible. And they're, they're, you know, if you're not a responsible parent, you have to suffer the consequences. Therefore, I did never have any trouble terminating parental rights if the need be, uh, but uh, uh, that was the most important thing was getting children taken care of. And what did you personally find to be the rewards and advantages of being a judge? Well, um, I, I, I can't say for other places, but I know in Nashville, Davidson County, Tennessee, judges are treated very respectfully by everybody. You know, they, and, and, and then there's some people uh, here in Nashville now that have come in from other states that don't even know who we are. But if you put the word judge in front of your name, they suddenly get with, with the program. They're very respectful. And I think it's a Southern thing. And uh, I think judges are kind of revered instead of, uh, you know, uh, disliked. Um, and I, I think that we probably got one of the best judiciaries around. And I, since I've retired, I've been to a lot of different counties. I've sat specially and all like that. And I see the judges. It seems like in the rural areas, the judges don't have the com camaraderie that we did here. You know, they, they don't, uh, they don't uh, meet together or, or anything like that. They travel circuits, so they're not really at the same time, same place. And so uh, I think Davidson County has a really good group of, of judges, and, and uh, they're highly respected. What motivated you to announce your retirement? Well, I'd married my sweetheart, <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, I was 65 at the time, and that's usually the time that you retire, and uh, uh, we had moved to Shelbyville, or we were going to. We didn't move yet because I couldn't leave my jurisdiction, but we had this little farm down there that we would go to during the weekend after we married, and, 
and we loved it and uh, he, he had already retired and we wanted to travel and, and do some things and so we uh, decided that this would be the best way to do it. And uh, I thought it was time for somebody else, you know, to take over. And I tell you how time flies, and I'm now 73, and uh, I, you wanted something more than being in the courtroom every day. And I, I, I like to go out when I'm pretty much ahead. And at this point, I hadn't made too many people mad, and I could retire respectfully, and, and the, you know, the, the governor was nice, and the... The, the whole deal was nice. The retirement ceremony was okay. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I miss the people, but I have not missed the work. I just do a different kind of work nowadays. What are you doing these days? Well, being retired and living on the farm, I've done a lot of stuff that I didn't think I would do at this age. But uh, we've had a uh, herd of Black Angus cows, which... Uh, uh, having been raised on a farm, I knew all about that. So Irby and I did that, and we had we just sold our herd last month, and uh, so life's a lot easier. <laughs> I'm not chasing cows right now, uh, but I've always loved horses, and I've always had horses, and so um, you know I still ride. I do ride with a helmet now. I used to not, but I figured that a broken bones okay, but if I break my head, not so good. <laughs> so. Um, I still ride, and uh, and I think all of that keeps me really young. It, it does. I, I have no health problems at all, knock on wood. And uh, uh, I love being outside. Now, my, what I do in the mornings, I get up every morning at 6 o'clock. I have dogs and cats that get me up just like they can tell time. And, uh, and we have family time looking at our beautiful view from the top of the hill. And then we go down and we clean stalls and we check out the donkeys and we uh, tend to the horses and uh, and then we get on for the day. Now I've uh, involved in several things in Bedford County and and have lots to do. Uh, believe me, my retirement is not sitting around. It's doing something all the time. And living on a farm, you don't have enough hours in a day. It's something to do all the time. But I think that Irby and I really enjoyed it. Um, we're both healthy. Uh, we've had a place in Florida that we'd go to, and, and uh, uh, so we traveled a bit, and we're enjoying grandchildren. I was going to ask about children and bonus grandchildren. How many are there, and where are they located? Well, together we have seven. We have three in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's Paige's children, Herbie's daughter. Uh, his son, Ford Simpkins, he has two boys, and then... Kathy Gale has two boys, so we've only got one girl to dote over, but uh, they're lots of fun, lots of fun. And what projects do you have that you're working on right now that haven't been completed, but you've kind of got a game plan about how you're going to finish those projects? Well, we, we are at a point where uh, uh, we, we love our farm, uh, but it has four houses on it. And it's 168 acres, so that's a lot for two. And we do it all we, because nobody does it like you do it, you know. And so we're busy doing it, and Irby does such a good job with it. It's a beautiful place, but we will probably decide to um, put that on the market because uh, we think that we probably would like to not have the farm when we're 80, and it'll take a while. And uh, we'll probably just do more traveling then. Or, we're, Do you think we you'll stay not, in Shelbyville or come back to We it? love Bedford County. It, it, it's the sweetest town ever. Uh, Shelbyville is, is just uh, lovely people. Uh, everyone we've ever met, uh, we've gotten a lot of dear friends. And we had not been down there. We're considered outsiders, but we do have lots of friends. Uh, but we like it, and uh, it, it, we're used to the rural life. And you see, in Shelbyville, you can get in a traffic jam around 4 or 5 o'clock, but it's not very long. It's maybe 15 minutes. But here, we're not used to the traffic that Nashville has now. And we, we have to come at least, you know, I, I come maybe once a week, and uh, Irby comes a little less than that. But we're amazed because the city has changed. It's, it's not my old Nashville. They've changed my streets, tore my buildings down. <laughs> I do know how to get here. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a different city. It's a good city, and it, it is the it town, but uh, we prefer the country life now. 
of all the questions that I've asked you, can you think of one that you wish I had asked? I think you've just about covered everything, <laughs> really. Well, you have had more than a fascinating life, and you have risen to the challenge so well in everything that you have tackled that I can't help but think that you would have some tips for us on how to make retirement even better, and what would those tips be? Well, you know, of course you don't want to stay home anywhere and not do anything. And there's so much to do out there that you never got to do when you were working. Uh, uh, I take all my newspapers to the Humane Society because they need them for the cages. Uh, I uh, take, clean out my barn, clean out things, take stuff to Goodwill. I am an organizer. <laughs> and I never had a chance to do that when I was working every day. And my goodness, you can go to a movie during the day. I mean, you couldn't do that when you were working. <laughs> and it's, it's just, and you can have lunch with your friends. And I have become a, 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 a cook. My husband says I'm a good cook, but you know, being a single person for a long time, that was just me, and I didn't cook. But being a farmer's wife, you cook three meals a day. So that's been interesting because I can actually you know, do things I thought I couldn't do. Like I made zucchini bread the other day. So you can cook and you can go to, go to different meetings. We have a great church down there. Something's going on in Shebbeville all the time. And you don't, you don't really know that because we're here you're in a metropolitan area. But in Shebbeville, it's the busiest little town I know. They have the antique car show around the square almost every week. They have chili cook-off. You know, they have the wine walk at Christmas. They have all this stuff going on. There's lots to do in little towns, and if you didn't know it, one of the best French restaurants ever around is in Tullahoma, Tennessee, and it's called Emile's, and it's wonderful, and it's just like an hour and 15 minutes from here. And the food is great in these little towns, and there's the Bell Buckle Cafe, you know, that's real close, and it's just a whole new world to discover when you're retired. So you could find those places around Jackson, Tennessee, too, I'll because they're there. <laughs> Let's close on your giving a brand new lawyer a little bit of advice. What would you tell a brand new lawyer? Well, first of all, I would say you got to work really hard. You got to do the best you can for your clients. You've got to tell your clients the bad with the good. So tell them the bad first and then tell them what may be good that might happen. And you got to always be prepared, I tell you, and, and don't go to court looking like a mass wrinkle, you know, go to court looking like you know what you're doing and and uh, I can't, you know, appearances are everything and uh, sometimes people forget that but, you know, if, if you put your best foot forward, you're going to impress the judge and if you're prepared, he's going to be so happy or she's going to be so happy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.